and participants, we are now live. Good morning, everyone. Um, this is the Committee on Rules for Monday, November 15, 2021. I understand that state law commonly requires that the following announcement be made at the beginning of every remote public hearing as follows. Due to the current public health emergency, city council committees are currently meeting remotely. We are using Microsoft Teams to make these remote hearings possible. Instructions for how the public may view and offer public testimony at public hearings of council committees are included in the public hearing notices that are published in the Daily News, Enquirer, and Legal Intelligencer prior to the hearings and can also be found on phlcouncil.com. Will the clerk please call the roll to take attendance? Members that are in attendance will please indicate that they are present when their names are called. Also, please say a few brief words when responding so that your image will be displayed on screen when you speak. Council Member Gilmore Richardson. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Good morning, colleagues. I am present. Council Member Quinona Sanchez. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chair and members. Council Member Squilla. Good morning, Mr. Chair and colleagues present. Mr. Chair, we also have uh, two council members present who are not members of the committee, Council Member Dom and Council Member Gautier. Thank you very much. Council Member O'Neill, uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Councilman O'Neill. Uh, Mr. Chair, I see we also have Council Member Cindy Bass, who has joined us. Absolutely. Councilman Cindy Bass. Yeah. So a quorum of the committee is present, and this hearing is now called to Thank order. you. Good morning. Good morning. This is the public hearing of the Committee on Rules regarding Bill Number 210633. Will the clerk please read the titles of the bill? Bill number 210633, amending Title 14 of the Philadelphia Code entitled Zoning and Planning by amending certain provisions of Chapter 14500 entitled Overlay Zoning Districts by creating the MIH, Mixed Income Neighborhoods Overlay District, by revising certain provisions of Chapter 14702 entitled Floor Area Height and Dwelling Unit Density Bonuses, and by making related changes all under certain terms and conditions. Before we begin to hear testimony from the witnesses we have for today, everyone who has been invited to the meeting to testify should be aware that this public hearing is being recorded. Because this hearing, because this hearing is public, participants and viewers have no reasonable expectation of privacy. By continuing to being in the meeting, you are consenting to being recorded. Additionally, prior to recognizing members for the questions or comments they have for witnesses, I will note for the record at this time that we will use the Microsoft chat feature available in Microsoft Teams to allow members to signify that they wish to be recognized. In order to comply with the Sunshine Act, the chat feature must only be used for this person. Before the clerk call the first panel, I want to acknowledge um, the authors of the bills, Councilwoman Jamie Gardier and Councilwoman Sint Maria Keona Sanchez for remarks. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, and thank you to the chair again and all my colleagues on the Rules Committee for this opportunity to be recognized on Bill 210633. This legislation aims to preserve affordability in some of Philadelphia's most rapidly gentrifying neighborhoods by requiring that affordable housing be part of new large development projects in certain parts of the 3rd and 7th districts. I'm very grateful to my colleague, Council Member Maria Quinona Sanchez for her partnership on this legislation and for always being such a strong champion for affordable housing and sustainable communities. Since day one, equitable development has been at the center of my agenda on council. And mandatory inclusionary zoning is a big part of the puzzle when we talk about equitable development. 
The mixed income housing bonus that already exists was a wonderful start. But considering the breakneck pace of development and the pace of displacement in many sections of Philadelphia, the time has come to see where it can be taken even further. There's currently no affordable housing requirement anywhere in our zoning code. And the impacts of that fact are reflected in gentrifying neighborhoods across our city and in my district in particular. To give you a sense, Housing prices have tripled in the University City area since the 1970s. In the last two decades alone, most neighborhoods east of 52nd Street have seen their Black populations cut in half. Nearly half of our district's households are cost burdened, and 70% of rental units cost more than $750 per month, an amount that's only affordable to 35% of third district residents. And so what this bill aims to ensure is that affordable housing continues to be available in neighborhoods where new developments are built and that Philadelphians of all income levels can continue to access um, amenity rich neighborhoods. The bill being considered today would require that new developments of 10 or more units offer 20% of those units at restricted prices for a 50 year period. The bill offers a chance to apply to the planning department to fulfill some of that requirement via offsite units or an increased housing trust fund contribution. But the primary goal remains getting those below market rate units in the buildings being developed. And I want to give you a sense of the kind of impact this could have in West and Southwest Philly. If we look at data on residential development just in the third district alone, if we look at all the permits for buildings with 10 or more units over the last three years, that comes out to 3,100 new units that have been approved. So if we do the math, um, if our bill had been in place just three years ago, we'd have 620 additional affordable homes in our district built by the private sector. On the other hand, if we continue to do nothing, housing prices will continue to go up and the black and brown people who are the backbone of this city will continually be pushed to the fringes. I also just want to take a moment to tell you about the community engagement we've been doing around this legislation. Since the bill was introduced in June, we've engaged over 800 third district residents. We participated in dozens of meetings and events uh, to discuss this bill with neighbors. We attended community meetings and we also held pop-ups at parks and on commercial corridors, tabling at play streets and rec center events, and phone banking. We reached out to every single registered community organization in my district multiple times, even those whose boundaries weren't proposed to be within the overlay. I took this outreach very seriously because this is the most expansive zoning bill I've ever introduced since becoming a council member. I'm proud of what my team and I were able to accomplish in spreading the word and soliciting feedback about this important land use policy even amidst the countless day-to-day -day demands put on our district council office. I truly believe our outreach on this bill was unprecedented. And the reason we did all that is because of the ever-increasing risk of displacement that our low-income black and brown communities are facing. We can't just sit back and watch our housing crisis happen to us. We as policymakers need to intervene, to chart a different course, to try whatever we can to alleviate the pressure on low-income residents. An inclusionary zoning is a proven mechanism that already exists in literally hundreds of municipalities across the nation to get new housing at significantly below market rates and in turn to preserve mixed income neighborhoods. I think I speak for both Council Member Sanchez and myself when I say that keeping our neighborhoods affordable for the individuals and families who live there for generations is our number one priority. I look forward to hearing from witnesses and to discussing this important legislation with all of you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Council Member Gaudier. Councilwoman Maria Keoma Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'll be brief because I think my council colleague, uh, Council Member Gautier, captured the spirit about, uh, by which we're working. I wanted to thank her um, for, as chair of the Housing Committee for understanding that 
mix, diverse mixed income communities don't happen by themselves, but they happen because of aggressive public policy stance. I want to thank the Planning Commission, the BIA, the community, stakeholders, our CDCs, and others who have engaged us, as she outlined in the conversation. Today is about another toolbox, not a perfect one, but one that could help the city using incentivized private market to create private housing. Over the last years, the private market has recognized more and more that they have a responsibility to help create the affordable housing so desperately nece necessary in the city of Philadelphia. Whether it's the BIA Affordable Housing Committee, the Developers Workshop, everyone understands now that the incentivized housing market has to do more. And they have come up with many creative ideas, which will also become part of our toolbox for crea creating affordable housing. You'll hear some of those ideas today. This is not about an either or, this is about an and and an and and an and. And many cities have several toolboxes that they utilize in creating affordable housing. So today is not the answer to affordable housing, it is about toolboxes. And the third, as it is in the seventh, we appreciate and work closely with our CDC partners to make sure that we're creating affordable housing in a very aggressive way. But as Council Member Gautier highlighted, the private market and its scale is unbearable in some of these neighborhoods. In neighborhoods like South Kensington and my own neighborhood of Norris Square, we see massive development happening and we see residents trying to be as accommodating as possible, but asking the question, what about us? This pilot will be measured and with other toolboxes will be um, adjusted to ensure that we are pro-development, but that we are unapologetic about being pro-development that is diverse and it is not a displacement tool, but one that creates opportunities for the current residents living in the neighborhood. Similar to the third district, we were very intentional in the geography, the geography that we chose because we understand those markets and those market values. But we also see speculation and folks overcharging in those neighborhoods, creating a challenge for affordability. And we want to ensure that as we're building this equitable design, the market is also adjusting and not just taking advantage of the incentives currently in place. The city did not have an opportunity to review all of the designations of opportunity zones. I had three days to look at this. And so we want to be very intentional in ensuring that where there's incentives already on land all the way to 2050, that we're maximizing those incentives. As I mentioned earlier, cities use several toolboxes, mandatory housing, uh, other toolboxes in this affordable landscape. For the residents of Kensington, many of which have been designated and are covered under this legislation, they believe we've broken Kensington because we're going to gentrify it and kick people out. So this is one way that we can demonstrate to the residents of Kensington that the development and the recovery of Kensington is not only for new folks, but, but also the residents that are there. So I want to thank everyone who's participated, the RCOs and all of the folks who have participated in the conversation around this. And I look forward to our, my colleagues' support. I look forward for it to its implementation as we sharpen another toolbox in our quest to make Philadelphia and stop being the most segregated city in the country, the most impoverished city in the, in the country, but one where equitable development happens because we're bold in our thinking and our willingness to help those most in need. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Councilman Maria Keona Sanchez. Will the clerk please call the first panel? Mr. Chairman. I want to acknowledge Councilman Curtis Jones. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I am going to Harrisburg on council business, dealing with the stolen and lost gun uh, court case, but I will attempt to log on in the car. But it's working eye on all bills. Thank you, Councilman Jones. Would Thank you. Please, you're welcome. Would the clerk please call the first panel? Paula Brumblow Burns. Good morning, members of the Rules Committee. I am Paula Brumblow Burns, Director of Legislation for the Philadelphia City Planning Commission. I am here to testify on Bill Number Two One Zero Six Three Three which was introduced into City Council on June 24th, 2021, by Council Members Gautier, Johnson, and Quinones Sanchez. Bill number 210633 amends Title 14 of the Philadelphia Code 
entitled Zoning and Planning, by amending certain provisions of Chapter 14-500, entitled Overlay Zoning Districts, by creating the MIH Mixed Income Neighborhoods Overlay District, revising certain provisions of Chapter 14-702, entitled Floor Area Height and Dwelling Unity, Unit Density Bonuses, and by making related changes all under certain terms and conditions. The bill proposes a new overlay district that covers portions of the 3rd and 7th Council Districts. Within this overlay, developments which contain at least 10 units or more and have a minimum of 25% of the total square footage of the building dedicated to residential use will be subject to a mandatory inclusionary housing requirement. Affected properties will be required to provide affordable dwelling units. The developer can select between providing 20% of dwelling units is affordable or 10% of dwelling units affordable along with a payment into the housing trust fund. The first 10% of affordable units must be on site. The developer needs to provide either a payment to the Philadelphia Housing Trust Fund or the additional percentage of affordable units on site or within one half mile of the on site units for the second 10%. For the affordable units, rental households earning up to 40% of the area median income and owner occupied households earning up to 60% of the area median income, monthly housing costs should not exceed 30% of gross income. The bill proposes the filing of an economic opportunity plan before zoning permits are issued to demonstrate efforts for representative opportunities and a diverse workforce for any project. To offset the costs of mandatory affordability requirements, the overlay provides for relaxed dimensional parking and use standards largely in keeping with the bonuses currently provided as a part of the mixed income housing bonus. This overlay as written will only apply to designated areas within the 3rd and 7th districts. The City Planning Commission at its meeting of September 23, 2021 recommended Bill Number 210633 for approval with proposed amendments, most of which have been addressed in the amendments that are being proposed today. I'll be happy to answer any questions at this time. Thank you very much. Any questions or comments from members of the committee? Hearing none, uh, thank you for your testimony. Would a clerk please call the next panel? Rashida Phillips, Dr. Devarian Baldwin. Thank you very much. Um, can you state your name for the record and you can begin your testimony? Good morning. My name is Rashida Phillips. I'm the Managing Attorney of Housing Policy at Community Legal Services of Philadelphia. We're grateful to have worked with City Council for several decades to support and advocate on behalf of tenants and to promote safe, affordable housing. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on Bill 210633, Mixed Income Neighborhoods Overlay District Legislation, introduced by Council Members Gautier, Kenone Sanchez, and Johnson. In Philadelphia, your zip code is the strongest determinant of your health and life expectancy. Where children born in neighborhoods only five mile, miles apart in Philadelphia face up to a 20 year difference in life expectancy. Children living in high poverty areas of our city are having their futures cut short and threatened by something they cannot control, where they lay their heads, eat, and play. Mixed income neighborhoods are one way to address these inequalities. Research has consistently shown that children living in mixed income neighborhoods have brighter futures and are better able to successfully break cycles of poverty in their families. Unfortunately, most naturally occurring affordable housing as well as most government supported affordable housing is in low income neighborhoods that don't have the benefits and amenities of their higher income or higher opportunity neighbors some of which may be in the same or a neighboring zip code. Mixed income housing policies are one of the few proven to create lower cost housing in higher opportunity neighborhoods. These policies can ensure that long-term residents who are dedicated to their neighborhood and their community are able to stay in their communities, even as rapid development occurs and takes advantage of their community's growth. It means that young families are able to remain in communities they have grown up in and want to stay in or return to to be close to family members and jobs. In a city like ours with growing housing demands at all income levels and a significant decline in the availability of federal subsidies for publicly funded housing, we have to leverage all available resources. Mixed income housing serves as a form of value exchange between the city and developers 
who are able to produce housing that aligns with community interests and needs and contribute to the demand for reasonably priced homes. In exchange for meeting those community needs, the developers obtain a number of benefits, including adopting existing bonuses, reducing parking requirements, and relaxed parking and use standards, which work to reduce the overall cost per unit to build and minimize procedural barriers to new development or otherwise allows for significant contributions to the housing trust fund to support the creation of affordable housing. Mixed income housing policies can be found in over 734 jurisdictions across 31 states and the District of Columbia. Overwhelmingly, these policies have been found to benefit entire communities, not just the people accessing affordable homes. For example, mixed income neighborhoods help to create workforce housing near job centers and transit corridors, which in turn helps to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from commuting and increase transit ridership amongst, amongst a stable employee base. In the future, we would like to see the program expanded to include more areas of the city and to apply to substantial rehabs and pre-existing structures, which may occur more often in some neighborhoods than new construction, where developers are converting old warehouses and industrial buildings into luxury and market rate housing. But in its current form, this legislation has the potential to significantly expand housing opportunities for Philadelphians and help to create integrated neighborhoods with improved health and quality of life between and across generations, making possible a more equitable, inclusive future in Philadelphia. In fostering these equitable outcomes, the legislation could mean that a person's racial identity and income level does not have to determine their life opportunities and results, such as access to a safe home and amenity-rich neighborhoods. The legislation is practical, simple to administer, sustainable, and balances the needs of developers, housing providers, the individuals and families who will access affordable quality housing, and the communities they will all live, work, play, grow, and thrive in. For these reasons, CLS strongly urges to favorably vote this bill out of committee. We look forward to continuing to work with city council, housing advocates, developers, and community members to continue to support and develop these policies. Thank you very much. You're welcome. The next panelist, please begin your testimony. Good morning. Uh, my name is Devarian Baldwin. I'm a professor um, at Trinity College and founding director of the Smart Cities Lab. Um, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak for you, speak to you at this morning. So we can all agree that cities are back in a very big way. Even during the pandemic, we see building cranes everywhere. But this new era of urban revitalization has not benefited all of our city's residents equitably. As land values rise and financial portfolios bulge, this raises the housing rates and other costs far above the means of existing residents who survive on minimum wages and or fixed incomes. And as the tide has turned, the shiny new loft departments are not for them. The luxury amenities are out of their reach. And longtime residents just count down the time until they are told that the place that they have called home for generations will no longer be their neighborhood. We can see this very saga unfold with the controversy around the university city townhouses. And this is not just a Philadelphia story. At the Smart Cities Lab, we research and consult on best practices for building equitable urban communities. And the Philadelphia story is a reflection of nationwide trends. In every neighborhood where I've traveled, Residents all say we want development. We want it, but we want to remain to be able to enjoy it. And the only way to raise land values while maintaining affordability is through strong, sustainable public policy. Bill number 210633 is essential to meet this goal of development without displacement. The general affordable housing overlay here is essential for community sustainability. But most important, the option of 60% or less area median income to measure affordability is a game changer. We know that the typical standard of 80% regional AMI means that most affordable housing is hardly affordable. And we also know that areas currently targeted for revitalization do not simply reflect the natural laws of the market, but result from a history of many times racially unjust public policy. For example, the Black Bottom area is a right target because city government, local universities, and private partners use urban renewal policy to displace over 600 low-income and African-American families from the very same area that is now considered a hotspot of urban revitalization. 
the quadripartite commission that formed in the 1960s agreed to develop scattered site affordable housing throughout what became University City. But that promise was broken. This too is a national story. And all of today's investors and stakeholders must account for how current investment values that are rising are built on a history of racial inequity. We cannot change this past, but we can alter the course of the future. Bill number 210633 begins the process of repair by accounting for a history of inequity to create a new vision of equitable planning. Let Philadelphia serve as a beacon to the nation by building out a vision of urban revitalization where development can happen, yes, and still a cross section of the city's residents can remain to enjoy its benefits. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your testimony. Any questions and comments from members of the committee? Um, I just Karen, wanted, oh, but Councilman Jamie Mr. Gaudier. Chair, I just wanted to thank both of them for not only for their powerful testimony, but um, for their work um, on these issues and on bringing, making sure that we have housing justice in our communities. Any other questions or comments from members of the committee? Harry Mr. Knight. Chair. Yes, Councilman yes. Captain Gilmore Richardson. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. And I wanted to thank the witnesses uh, for their testimony. Uh, I wanted to go back to the testimony of Rashida Phillips uh, from Community Legal Services. And you mentioned in your testimony about the naturally occurring affordable housing, uh, particularly in these uh, areas. Um, if you could speak to any specific trends um, that you were seeing, uh, even as a result of the a release of the census, the recent census data around uh, naturally occurring affordable housing in the city and particularly in these areas? Yeah, so I don't have the data in front of me for the specific areas, um, but I can certainly get that for you. But as uh, the council member talked about in the beginning of, of the hearing, we are seeing a, a raise in the rents, um, a rise in rents in terms of naturally occurring affordable housing, such that where a few years ago, an average rent for um, you know a one or two bedroom home was about $750 a month, we're now seeing that those prices are an average of about $1,250 a month. So just in a few short years, um, rents have raised to about uh, over $500, right? So we're, that, that sort of trend is happening around the city, and I can certainly get some um, data for you all and, and send that to you around the most recent census data, as you suggested. Okay, that'll be helpful. Thank you very much, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank both of you for your testimony. Will the clerk please call the next panel? Dr. Jonathan Wilson, Jr., Rakea Lindsay, Pastor Jay Brodnax, and Dwayne Drummond. Is there a specific order? The ladies first. Okay. Will the first panelist please begin your testimony? All right, well, let me take the lead on this then. Reverend Broad next, can you please begin your testimony? Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Good morning, and it's always good to see you, sir. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Reverend Jay Broadnax. I'm here to testify for Bill 210663. Uh, 633, the Mixed Income Neighborhoods Overlay Bill. I am the pastor of Mount Pisgah AME Church at 41st and Spring Garden Streets, and our congregation has occupied that corner since 1942 and have been in what's now the third district since our establishment in 1833. During the course of our existence in, in what is now West Powelton, we have seen neighborhood the neighborhood go through many transitions and changes. For years, it occupied an area known colloquially as the Black Bottom, 
a community of working class people. Although like any com every community, our neighborhood has had its problems, but living there were uh, by and large very proud, hardworking, decent people. Our congregation has been a staple in this community since its existence. Some of the members of our congregation have relocated to other communities, some by choice, but others because they couldn't afford the tax increases, others moved out by other effects of gentrification. Now their children, many of whom would love to return to the places where they once called home, are unable to because of the way gentrification has made their properties, made properties unattainable. No one is arguing against progress. Clearly, some of the development that's taken place has enhanced the neighborhoods and made them more appealing. What we're concerned about is balance. Finding ways that development and opportunities for residents in the neighborhoods are, uh, allow for a blending of people from a variety of socioeconomic backgrounds. We need legislation that encourages that kind of balance. And I believe that this mixed income neighborhoods overlay bill is a critical step, first step uh, in helping to foster that kind of balance. Intentionally creating mixed income neighborhoods will not only create more equity, but I believe it's an important step in diminishing the kinds of frustration that fosters violence and other kinds of social issues. Uh, we have to build a sense of ownership, a common destiny in our city that starts in neighborhoods. I think this bill begins to address the loopholes that developers often use when they want to get around the spirit and intention of the zoning process. Uh, the more we can do this, the more we can instill in residents a sense of their own agency and power. On another note, it's, it's it, quiet as it's kept, homelessness is still a problem in Philadelphia and even in gentrifying areas and neighborhoods like this. If we're really committed to housing security and making sure that homelessness is diminished, we need developers to invest in a stock of housing that's available to people on the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum that is part of neighborhoods that are mixed uh, in, in income. Otherwise, we end up creating a city divided with stable neighborhoods for some and folks that are less financially stable moving from place to place. And we can't continue to kick that can down the road. Why should some be able to enjoy community amenities and others be denied them even though their uh, foreparents who were perfectly positioned to enjoy them? I recognize this is merely a first step but I think it's a critical step and hopefully we'll begin to use this to exemplify the realization of uh, that's needed in this city that residents have the power to recreate a city that's characterized by real brotherly love and honest sisterly affection. So I stand in support, Mr. Chair, of bill number 210633. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your testimony. The next panelist state their name for the record and begin your testimony. How you doing? My name is Rakia Lindsay. I am a Mantua resident. Um, and my testimony is in support of Bill 210633. Uh, as a Mantua resident, we are seeing an enormous amount of development. And again, as a resident, we are for development. However, we would like to see development that includes us and is accessible to us. Uh, um, in that this bill begins to shed light on us as people who are already here who may not be able to afford market rate value housing, but would very much like to maintain positions in our neighborhoods, um, grow our families here and build into the neighborhood that we were, have been a part of for most of us generations. Um, and so this requirement for developers to have to include us in their ideas of building in our neighborhoods. It begins the process of them coming into the neighborhood as good neighbors. Uh, and so that's my testimony. Thank you very much for your testimony. Will the next panelist please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Uh, my name is Dwayne Drummond. Uh, I am the president of the Mantua Civic Association. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, for giving me an opportunity to testify on Bill 210633. I'm going to be short and I'm going to be brief because um, I know this is rule committee and we need to get this to 
the whole committee, the city council. Um, so I'm just thankful for everybody who presented this bill. Um, I'm thankful for council member Godier for her community outreach efforts. Um, and like I said before, um, we support this bill and it's some time for some action. So thank you so much for this opportunity. You're welcome, Mr. Drummond. You keep up the good work, too. I follow you, young man. So I'm very aware of the work that you're doing out there, man. Will the next panelist please state your name for the record and begin your testimony? I see you, my former war leader, Bernadette. How are you? You on mute, Bernadette. Okay. Good morning. How are you? Oh, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Always good I, to see you. Just state your name for the record and go ahead and begin your testimony. Okay. Um, Bernadette White, ward leader of the 24th Ward. Um, in, in my ward, we have a lot of development going on. And it's the, the rate of the apartments are going up. We try to see if when a developer develops something, could we get... Uh, didn't get uh, hello? Can everyone please put their phone or computer on mute if they're not speaking? Go ahead, Ms. Bernadette. Okay, I have seen developers come in. They, um, majority are building apartments. And um, we are asking for at least for them to put some affordable apartments in, in their units that they are building. I heard, I don't know how true it is, that on 39th Street near Fairmount, where they building um, homes or apartments, I heard they supposed to be affordable. I heard that from one developer, but I'm going to quote him on that. I will call him up to find out more about that because I, uh, it, to mix people together is a good thing. And I believe they shouldn't be moved out. And I believe there should be affordable houses for people that can't afford $1,200 a month rent. Kind of high. <laughs> But um, I'm for the bill. Oh, I have to say the bill number. Um, I'm for bill 210633. Is that the bill? That's the bill. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Bernadette, for your testimony. Again, always good to see you. Good to see you, too. Um, next panelist, Dr. Wilson. Can you hear your testimony? Greetings, my name is Dr. Jonathan Wilson, and um, I'm the executive director of the Fathership Foundation. The Fathership Foundation uh, operates in the 51st Ward, so there's a lot of uh, development going on. We support Bill 210633 um, and all the efforts of uh, City Council, specifically uh, Councilwoman Gordier and um, Sanchez and uh, as they have authored this bill. I think it's a great bill to mix people together and uh, we support all the efforts to sustain the uh, housing in the area as not to exacerbate the uh, educational health and wealth disparities that already that already exist there. So we thank you so much and we stand in support of the bill. Thank you very much and as always good to see you Dr. Wilson on a case on the front line. So good to see you sir. Good to see you as well. Thank everybody for their testimony. Would the clerk please call the next panel? Ryan Spock, Mo Rushti, Andy Toy, Ben Connors, Jamal Johnson, Lauren Gilchrist, Karen Harvey, and Marcus Brown. Thank you very much. Uh, well, Karen, uh, please begin by stating your name, officially for the record to begin your testimony.
Is Karen Harvey available? If not, can I have Lauren Gilchrist to please state her name for the record and begin her testimony? Yes, uh, good morning. My name is Karen Harvey. I'm can we the begin your testimony. Thank you. I'm the director of the Philadelphia Rent Control Coalition, a lead organizer with TURN and a Philadelphia tenant. I am testifying in support of bill number 210633. 1619 is the earliest recorded date when ships carrying kidnapped men, women, and children from Central African nations arrived on American shores. While it is not my intent to give you a history lesson, my point is that I envision the hollow, hopeless looks in the eyes of many of the young black males and females in my West Philadelphia community, which I see far too often, would have matched the eyes of the newly enslaved ancestors of the majority of the people in this hearing today when they emerged from the ships of our Middle Passage. Then, as now, many Black youth in this nation are feeling discarded. For today's purpose, I ask you to narrow your gaze to the urban landscape that is Philadelphia, where the hopeless eyes on my block see a system that offers them no solution. In the book-long poem by Langston Hughes, Montage of a Dream Deferred, the author describes and defines a 24-hour day in the life of Har in the life in Harlem in 1951 of a people whose doors to the dreams of their fathers were being slammed shut with Black folk on the outside. I do not over-dramatize when I say that for young Black people in Philadelphia, the guns and violence in this city are in great part due to dreams crushed. I need you to see gentrification that way. The taking over of our neighborhoods by young white and affluent college students and millennials looks and feels like the flame of the candle, which light any dreams of hope being snuffed out. Standing on my porch, I have a clear view of the 52nd Street corridor. It bears no resemblance to the 52nd Street of my youth. I grew up in the 60s. Some of you may know a little something about Mr. Silks and the Nixon and Capitol movie theaters. How interesting that as the University of Pennsylvania and Drexel University began moving on up from Market Street to Baltimore Avenue and 34th to 52nd Street, black people began to be being pushed out of our communities. With each shiny new building, People's homes were bought out from under them, leaving our young people and seniors whose incomes did not and have not progressed at the same rate as those bright and shiny white faces who now gladly put their keys in the doors of those who used to call the neighborhood home. Two years ago, the only, I'm sorry, two years ago, the only thing many white people knew about 52nd Street was at it as an L stop where they then clutched their purses, briefcase, and pearls, sighing in relief when the train's doors closed. Now those of us who have managed to hang on watch as they exit the turnstiles and walk down the streets oblivious to their surroundings, armed with the assumption that soon and very soon, the old neighborhood will look nothing like it does today. In a minute, the ominous stares of those hopeless eyes will be gone as the now 35 to 45% of their income, which goes to rent, will make its way up to 50 to 60%, rendering them unable to afford to live in the only place they call home. But where to go? Without clearly drawn boundaries on how much of the neighborhood you take to give to those without investment in our community, there will, be on, there will only be hopelessness which produces more guns, violence, and vacant stairs. Dreams deferred. I strongly urge you to adopt the proposed changes being presented in this hearing so that young Black Philadelphians, families, and seniors in my neighborhood can afford to remain where our roots are, where we do have an investment. Bring your urban renewal, but don't push us out in the process. As always, I thank you for the opportunity to speak my truth. Thank you very much for your testimony. Ms. Lauren Gilchrist, state your name for the record and begin your testimony. 
Hi, everyone. My name is Lauren Gilchrist, and I'm the immediate past president of NAOP Greater Philadelphia, as well as the co-chair presently of the Government Affairs Committee. Uh, NAOP is a 501c6 organization that represents the commercial real estate development community in Philadelphia. And we are also a founding member of the Philadelphia Real Estate Alliance. Thank you to Chairman Johnson and the rest of the committee for permitting us to provide testimony on Bill 210633. The member, uh, membership of NAOP understands that affordable housing is an important issue in the city that the public and business communities collectively need to address with a comprehensive and holistic solution. The proposed bill, which utilizes zoning to dictate social policy in two targeted districts, falls short of what we would deem a holistic approach. The proposed bill will likely have the unintended consequences, actually, of limiting additional affordable housing and could also result in foregone job creation and lost economic growth. NAOP is highly supportive of equitable, inclusive economic growth. The city of Philadelphia cannot take for granted at the growth in real estate and other industries that we've realized over the last 20 plus years that has brought more people to the city, created more jobs, increased tax revenues, and brought opportunities to every corner of the region. Sustained growth has provided Philadelphia with resources to address many of its intractable historical problems and has helped those who have lived in underserved communities. This growth has also led to substantial new tax revenue for the city. As an industry, the commercial real estate community relies on predictability of land use and therefore cannot support district by district mandates that do not include a public process. Zoning is meant to be a guide in a thoughtful and balanced way, is meant to guide in a thought and balanced way, the path to development and growth while considering the social policy objectives of the city, which are extremely important. A holistic zoning policy can absolutely achieve the objectives of growth as well as equity. Zoning needs certainty and should only be altered or modified with a thorough, deliberative and robust process involving input from all parties, public, private, as well as community. Philadelphia is a city with a high poverty rate, which we must acknowledge, high construction costs, which are also important when we think about the development landscape, and low rents when compared to other cities. With the combination of these factors, government policy alone will not correct the affordable housing shortage in Philadelphia. NAOP understands that the council members want to do something in their districts to make housing more affordable. Unfortunately, though, the proposed legislation as it's currently drafted could have the opposite effect by restricting the amount of affordable housing developed in the proposed districts. The affordability requirements proposed in the bill are not in line with even the most stringent of public incentives, such as low-income housing tax credits, which require 20% of units at 50% AMI or 40% of units at 60% of AMI. Even with these subsidies, affordable housing is challenging to finance and construct, even more so now in light of the phasing out of the 10-year tax abatement and the high inflation environment that the United States finds itself in. With the added additional requirements of the proposed bill, these districts will not attract the necessary support and capital investment and lend from the investment and lending communities, excuse me, for new projects, resulting in even less affordable housing. Affordable housing requires public subsidy in almost any jurisdiction. This subsidy can come in many forms, including inexpensive land, tax benefits, or direct public capital investment. The city has the tools to shape an effective affordable program that would incentivize both public and private investments in affordable housing. NAOP and the Philadelphia Real Estate Alliance are supportive of engaging with the city to provide more transparent and streamlined mechanisms to direct these resources. In this way, we can develop a holistic and comprehensive plan that connects revenues derived through the new construction tax to directly support new affordable housing development, create affordable housing, utilize the untapped land resources in the land bank, and find additional opportunities to ensure housing affordability is achieved. Without such a functioning citywide approach, earnest attempts to address housing affordability at a district by district level are incomplete and unfortunately insufficient. NAOP and the Philadelphia Real Estate Alliance sincerely want to be a part of the solution to balance to the balance of equitable growth and affordable housing, and we would like to work together with you. Thank you for your consideration.
Thank you very much. Will the clerk please call the next witness? I see Ben, I see Mo, I see Andy. Even one of you want to move forward, Mr. Johnson. Not everybody at one time. Ben Connors, go ahead. Start your testimony, sir. Yes, sir. Well, good morning. I'm Ben Connors, President and CEO of the General Building Contractors Association. Uh, GBCA is one of the nation's oldest and largest uh, commercial contractor associations with a membership of over 300 commercial, industrial, institutional, general contractors, subcontractors, material suppliers, and construction service firms throughout the greater Philadelphia region. Uh, we'd like to thank the chairman, uh, Chairman Johnson, and all the committee members for allowing us to testify today on bill number 210663. Uh, affordable housing is a vital issue for the city of Philadelphia, with far too many of our citizens not able to be provided adequate housing for the families. Uh, while we all recognize this critical issue, we believe the piecemeal approach offered today will not combat the shortage of affordable housing units throughout the city. While we took uh, issue with how it was funded, GBCA did support the concept of neighborhood pre preservation initiatives in part because it took steps to address this issue for the city as a whole. Uh, impo and imposing inclusionary zoning on multifamily construction in two councilmatic district is not a comprehensive plan and may in fact result in a decrease in affordable housing units. Additionally, the legislation, if passed, will result in further uncertainty at a time when we need to build, we need to be building stability for families and job creators to lift our city beyond the impacts of the global pandemic. The construction tax, the abatement reductions, and the near elimination of the mixed income housing bonus program have all been passed during the pandemic and have not yet had an opportunity to be fully absorbed by the market. Most of the projects currently underway were in the pipeline prior to the start of pandemic. The uncertainty only serves to divert new projects from entering that pipeline, thereby slowing the future growth in our city. In recent years, Philadelphia has significantly increased regulatory imposed costs on construction at a pace that has been a counterweight to growth and has contributed to Philadelphia's lagging behind other peer cities. These cost increases and burdensome regulations also further incentivize some building some to build illegally without city oversight, taxes, permits, and fees, thereby creating new safety and enforcement challenges and costs that did not previously exist. Philadelphia has dramatically less construction activity than other peer cities and suffers greatly as a result. With more construction, we will see more opportunities for small local businesses, which would lead to more poverty reduce, reducing job opportunities. With more construction, we would encourage more population growth, giving us giving residents uh, help to lift uh, the city through tax revenue. To provide higher, higher funding levels needed for schools and eroding infrastructure. With more construction activity, our existing housing market would be forced to turn affordable using affordable units into those that pay market or wouldn't be forced to turn affordable units into those that would pay market rate, but instead build new affordable housing housing units. In order to have more construction activity in Philadelphia, we need the right conditions for growth. We request that City Council rethink imposing a piecemeal restriction on development and instead ask that you work with GBCA and the Philadelphia Real Estate Alliance to come up with solutions that encourage construction activity while addressing the needs of the city. This city needs private development to produce the housing that current and new residents want and to create the jobs and tax revenue that are so badly needed to effectively run the city. Mandating what can or cannot be built in an entire council managed district will have adverse consequences, not just on those in the district, but on the conditions for growth in our entire city. GBCA's member employ, members employ over tens of thousands of workers in the Philadelphia region. Fair, fam, fair family sustaining living wage, wages to our union workforce and consequently also pay millions of dollars in taxes. For over 130 years, our membership has helped to build this city and we want to see it succeed. But creating an inclusionary zoning mandate will drive away investment and thousands of jobs that have a choice on where, where they will ultimately land. We want them to land here in Philadelphia. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you very much for your testimony, Ben. Next, I'm going to call up is Mo Rushi. Mo, you can begin. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Come My on. name is Mo Wright. Can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Begin. All right. 
My name is Mo Rushdie and I serve as treasurer of the Building Industry Association of Philadelphia, a trade association of mostly residential developers working throughout Philadelphia, along with the professionals who provide them with the products and services. I also co-chair the BIA's Affordable Housing and Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committees and serve as a leadership member of the Philadelphia Real Estate Alliance. I want to thank Chairman Johnson and the rest of the committee for allowing me to provide testimony today on Bill Number 210663. The BIA also recognizes the urgent need for affordable housing options in Philadelphia and has worked with counseling good faith to craft policies that will ensure new development that helps replace the units lost over time and provides opportunities for home ownership and prosperity in the neighborhoods where we build. Bill number 210663 moves the city in the wrong direction, however. The scope of this, bills, of this bill means that 20% of the city will have dramatically different rules for multifamily construction than the rest of the city and preclude private sector developers from helping council achieve its goals for equity. As currently proposed, the bill's inclusionary zoning rules will grind all such construction to a halt in those districts, driving many millions of dollars in investment and thousands of jobs away. It doesn't have to be this way. Every thriving city needs a mix of affordable and market rate housing. Most market rate developers cannot overcome the high cost of construction in Philadelphia and would allow them to include affordable units in their projects. The idea of trading more density for more affordability has always made sense. And the mixed income housing bonuses would have worked sufficiently, but for the recent changes. The BIA proposed amendments based on careful analysis that would have incentivized and prioritized the delivery of affordable units on the site, on site, over payments into the housing trust fund. These bonuses were a key component of overcoming Philadelphia's high construction costs in neighborhoods that would not otherwise see investment. Instead, council chose to effectively gut the program. We have demonstrated repeatedly that the BIA supports strategies to increase number of affordable units being built by the private sector, but the math must work. The BIA provided council detailed development models to inform and guide this legislation. But by decreasing the incentives and increasing the requirements, as in Bill Number 210633, very few affordable units will be built. The trust fund will not get the funds it needs, and City Hall will be sending a clear signal to the real estate community to invest elsewhere. If the goal is to force the private market to take part in equity, this policy will not achieve that result. You can't mandate anyone to build in Philadelphia. And soon, maybe no one will. Council member Gauthier mentioned today, with that 3,200 permits have been issued, then 640 units would have been built. In reality, if based on this legislation, only 20% of these 3,200 unit jobs would have been developed to begin with, resulting in maybe 100 units of affordable housing that would have been created. Councilwoman Kenyatta Shan says, mentioned land prices. We have proven that 20% IZ at 40% AMI at zero land cost do not work in the neighborhoods that have modest rents and high construction costs that require affordable housing the most. Another critical issue besides the math is the 50-year deed restriction. We understand why the sponsors are critical of shorter restrictions, but the fact remains that banks are overwhelmingly unwilling to underwrite projects with such a long restriction. And we suggested 20 years as an alternative. The language as currently proposed will preclude the private sector from providing the affordable units on site, and so no new units will be created. The BIA encourages City Council to review the data we provided with an independent and objective party. We are confident that such analysis will demonstrate what balance of requirements and incentives will work in the context of the reduced bonuses, decreased tax abatement, new construction tax, and impending inflation. We also invite City Council to look carefully at the BIA's blueprint for affordable housing. It is frustrating that this dramatic legislation is ostensibly proposed in the name of affordable housing, but the city continues to squander its best opportunities to generate significant quantities of affordable housing for its residents. In the third council Manning district, there are 647 public owned parcels that, that could be used to house those in need and 1,142 in the 7th district. In the blueprint, we argue that the city housing crisis can be resolved if City Hall simply increases its capacity to dispose public land quickly to qualified applicants. The city needs 30,000 affordable homes by 2028. 
you have the land, the development community knows how to build what you want. And we supported the Neighborhood Preservation Initiative to reach lower AMIs. Imagine how many affordable units could be built on these 1,789 parcels in both these districts. What are we waiting for? The BIA has provided concrete suggestions on how this bill can work better, willingly participating in discussions and clearly supporting solutions that would work for all. But as currently written, bill number 210663 does not work for anyone and will not provide housing relief to the residents you intend to help. Once again, proposed legislation stands to punish the development community for the shortfalls of its affordable housing policies. This legislation will drive up rents by 20 to 30 percent of market rate homes that cannot be sustained in Philadelphia's neighborhoods. This bill will depress housing supply and thereby drive, uh, drive up rents. These overlays will become development deserts. We strongly oppose this bill in its current form and ask that the, this legislation be held so that we can work for, further with sponsors to find the right numbers and draft amendments that will achieve Council's goals. Together, we can find a solution. Please, let us take a step back and work together. Thank you for your consideration. You're welcome. <laughs> Andy Toy. Hey, good morning, Chairperson uh, Johnson and members of City Council's Committee on Rules. Um, and thank you. Uh, it was great to see you at St. Rita Kasha's and Councilman Squilla. Um, great uh, affordable project for seniors. Always good to see you, Andy. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Andy Toy, and I'm the policy director for the Philadelphia Association of Community Development Corporations, or PACDC. Thank you for listening to PACDC's testimony in support of Bill Number 210633, which seeks to address Philadelphia's pressing need to provide more affordable homes in the face of many residents experiencing unaffordable rents, homelessness, and gentrification pressures pushing them out of their neighborhoods. And thank you to Council Member Scott T.A. and Quinona Sanchez for your leadership on this challenging and sometimes contentious but critically important issue to facing our city. And I agree with Councilwoman Quinona Sanchez that it's not an either or, um, as some people might want to put it. Um, it's, it's all of the above. As we all know, Philadelphia currently has the highest poverty rate of any large city in the country. We have seen past planning and development policies and events such as the pandemic serve to deepen and reinforce segregation, disinvestment, displacement, and inequity in our city. At the same time, you're seeing how some neighborhoods are quickly justifying and becoming unaffordable for those who have may have lived there their whole, whole lifetimes or who have been working hard to raise families in a stable place. The data shows that 40% or over 500,000 Philadelphians cannot afford their monthly rent or mortgage. It's past time to find an array of strategies to help repair the, the harm. There are now numerous studies showing that mixed income neighborhoods create long-term positive opportunities and impacts for residents. Um, I included uh, a link to that in my written testimony. A mixed income neighborhood overlay district is one very important tool to build more equitable neighborhoods. PACDC, speaking on behalf of more than 60 member community development organizations, strongly supports the implementation of mixed income neighborhood neighborhoods overlay districts. We do understand that there are concerns from some since, since a mandatory inclusionary housing policy has yet to be tried in Philadelphia. However, such policies are in use in more than 700 jurisdictions around the United States, including in New Jersey, Massachusetts, and California with some quote unquote modest but real impact on the overall number of affordable units uh, according to studies. Um, and I also have a link to that. Our support for this bill comes after years of experience with attempts at incentivizing mixed income developments on a voluntary basis, which have been insufficient. I was part of the zoning code commission when we put forward the compromise plan to allow developments uh, zoning bonuses with an alternative to pay in lieu fee into the housing trust fund, and those have just been insufficient altogether. While this policy has resulted in resources to expand and preserve affordable housing opportunities in other neighborhoods, it has not resulted in affordable units being built on site in market rate developments in stronger real estate markets and changing neighborhoods. Only a mandatory approach will achieve that. 
The goal of on-site affordable units is important in to support mixed income communities and the opportunities for lower income residents to live in higher opportunity communities rather than having the vast majority of affordable units being built solely in lower income communities. We agree that there will be need, need to be adjustments made to this policy over time as market conditions change. But without an initial step, nothing will happen. We believe that the proposal for setting a 40% AMI limit for affordable rents and 60% AMI limit for affordable sales in projects of 10 units or more makes sense. We support density bonuses and other incentives as important offsets to make mixed income projects financially feasible at these affordability levels. 10 units seems to be a good trigger as smaller projects won't be affected. We also support long-term affordability controls to ensure these units are not lost from the affordable housing inventory. Finally, since many of our member CDCs are experienced developers of affordable housing, we think there are opportunities for market rate developers to mar partner with them to support marketing and income certification for qualified occupants upon initial lease up for sale, as well as upon resale or re-rental of affordable units. It will also be important to invest in the necessary infrastructure to ensure effective compliance with affordability requirements on an ongoing basis. And thank you again for the opportunity to support um, and testify in support of Bill 210633. Thank you very much for your testimony, Andy. Um, next, I'm going to ask for Ryan to state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Uh, my name is Ryan Spack. Thank you to this entire committee, Chairperson Johnson, and to my councilperson, Jamie Gaudier, for allowing me the opportunity to testify this morning. Um, again, my name is Ryan Spack. I am one of the principal partners at Spack Group, a company my mom, Marsha, and I formed 11 years ago in a West Philadelphia neighborhood called Cedar Park. As a local small business in West Philly whose product is rental housing, Spack Group heard the voices of our neighbors regarding inequity, displacement, and involvement. So we changed our mission, and in the last five years, SPAC Group has proudly brought 91 units to market at 60% AMI or less without a single dollar of public subsidy to purchase, renovate, develop, or build the apartments. Our model does work, but it is not because of any IZ legislation. What makes our developments work without direct subsidy is a creative mix of well-priced land, density, tax abatement, private investment, favorable financing, and predictable and properly managed construction costs. In the same time that SPAC Group has successfully implemented its voluntary inclusionary housing model, many factors have threatened our inclusionary housing model, especially over the past year, including expensive updates to the construction code, the 1% tax on new construction, the reduction in the 10-year tax abatement, which significantly increases annual operating costs, higher contingency requirements by banks for hard costs, additional design and private inspection requirements, increases in land purchase costs, supply chain issues to, to construction material, and inflationary costs that are here to stay and will eventually force higher interest rates, raising again our operating costs. Last week, I was honored when the principal architects of Bill 21063 asked me to review their legislation and run models to find where we could all find success in building more equitable and affordable options into the real estate developments happening in our neighborhoods. As I understand it, it is the goal of this IZ legislation to have private development build affordable options into their developments. I was asked, in what scenario does the mandatory inclusionary housing legislation work in the current market conditions? So SPAC group ran scenarios at various percentage levels and at varying levels of AMI under 80% against the market, its rents, costs, and the factors named before. Our findings found that not one scenario financially penciled out with the market rents of non-center city core neighborhoods like those in Cedar Park and Kensington. Every analysis found that this legislation is impossible in non-center city core neighborhoods when combining the factors of today with its requirements, no matter the percentage of units. Even if today's pressures are met, developers and property managers may still have to raise rents to unseen levels in their market units. For example, in one of our modeling scenarios, to meet the required 20% of the units at 40% AMI, SPAC Group would have to charge $2,150 for a two-bedroom apartment in Cedar Park to be able to meet all development requirements and afford the mandatory inclusionary legislation. This price point is $500 more than we have ever achieved in my 10 years building and managing rentals in Cedar Park. The market will reject these prices. 
And as a result, the, mark, the project will never be financed or constructed, and neither will the affordable units. This is not what SPAC group, you, or our community want. The mandatory inclusionary model desired may only work in markets with incredibly affluent market rents that hover approximately a dollar per square foot more than the neighborhoods that we have built in in the past. Because of the additional pressures placed on development by the city, by inflation, and soon by banking, the mandatory inclusionary legislation will force developers into two scenarios from what we see. Either developers will move to build only luxury priced units or move out of our marketplace entirely. The result of smaller mid-sized developers like SPAC Group will be incredibly harmful on our future viability. As a result, I fear for my 11 employees and the negative trickle-down effect through the real estate industry to our colleagues like title companies, realtors, and subcontractors. Simultaneously, future affordable options built without direct public subsidy like the 91 units built by SPAC Group will not be placed in a service in the neighborhoods that need these units the most, thus defeating the entire purpose of this legislation. Many years ago, I sat before council and testified to the flaws, weaknesses, and lack of partnership with developers of the first inclusionary housing legislation. Through the current IZ legislation, only 17 affordable units have been built, half of them by SPAC group. The other 82 units that we have built of the 91 units that we have put into market were done without IZ legislative incentives. This bill can do better. As of right now, no one on this committee has seen a single study showing how many units this legislation will create for our neighborhoods or its impact to the real estate development community in Philadelphia. For SPAC Group, now that we are aware of this legislation, we have put every inclusionary housing development we had in this overlay that was planned for 23 and 24, we have put on hold. I plead with this committee to not pass this legislation out of committee today or in the near future, and instead study it properly understand the numbers more thoroughly, work with developers like myself to find a model in today's market climate that will actually build the more affordable options from every private development. SPAC Group has shown this can be done, but it cannot be done under today's pressure, pressures coupled with this legislation. I appreciate the time. Thank you very much for the testimony. Thank you very much for your testimony. Ryan, I have a quick question. Yes, sir. What affordable units that you have provided um, to date, what's the average rent? Um, so it depends on the size of the apartment. Um, I can give you an idea of, uh, the last two projects that we built at 5050 Baltimore Avenue. We worked with the community that surrounded that project as well as the local congregations. And, uh, we built a building that was double the size that we would have been allowed by zoning. Um, as a result, we were able to put three more affordable options into that project. One of those units is a handicap accessible apartment, a one bedroom apartment for $795 a month. Uh, the other units were at 950 and 1040. Those two units were actually provided in partnership with PHMC. PHMC placed two single females in each one of those units who were previously homeless, who were only paying 10% of their uh, income. Uh, in the other project that we did, uh, we saved 44 units that were coming out of a affordability restriction. They were previously an affordable housing development from the 90s. Uh, we put a 25 year deed restriction on the affordability of those units. A two bedroom apartment is $875. A three bedroom apartment is $970 to $1,000. Um, and uh, I, I don't believe there's any four units in that project, but that is, that's the average. Um, most of the folks that live in that development um, are actually receiving uh, some kind of subsidy through PHMC or Valley Youth House or Delta or one of our numerous partners um, who help folks with housing insecurities. Thank you very much for your testimony. You are um, welcome. Before I call on Jamal Johnson, uh, Mo, I just want to ask a question in regards to BIA. Um, thus far, how many, um, in terms of your affordable housing committee, how many units would you say that BIA has produced thus far to date, right? Uh, prior to the uh, preservation legislation that we recently passed, but just on the strength of it's just a socially good thing to do, right? And, you know, that's the mission that y'all are working on 
can you give us an idea of how many units BIA, um, your subcommittee, have provided thus far to date? And also, on average, what the rent costs are for one bedroom, two bedroom apartments? That's a great question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would say that close to 80% of all new development that has happened in Kensington thus far are all affordable units. If I take my company as an example, the River Wards Group, we are currently developing about 300 units and we have about 850 units in, in the pipeline. 100% of these units are considered affordable units that lie between 75% to 85% AMI, okay? So, and, 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 I, and I say that because um, uh, the market rate units, as Ryan has just detailed, and Ryan and I have very similar models, we deal with very similar investors, and we deal with the same capital stack of senior debt that finances these jobs. The market rate units in these deep neighborhoods or outlier neighborhoods or new and upcoming neighborhoods are low enough to meet the standards of affordability and they're not at 120% AMI. Again, we're talking about an average of 80% AMI for 100% of the units. That was just a thought that came to my mind. Um, before I call on Jamal Johnson, um, Councilman Dom has a question. Can I, a point of information, is that okay? Absolutely, to the, um, of the bill. I wanted to respond to what Mo said that the majority of his units were at 75 to 85 percent of AMI. Um, my office did an affordable housing study for the third district just to see where um, what the state of affordable housing is and where people were. The average third district resident um, is at 34 percent of AMI. And so the gut the gap in the gulf between 34% um, of AMI and 85% of AMI is so huge that it doesn't make sense to call that affordable for many of our communities. Thank you. And I agree, and I agree with the council, councilwoman, and hence our plan to, that we have presented for both the third and the seventh district to create 300 affordable home ownership, wealth creating, single family home, homes on public land that would go to constituents in the 3rd and 7th district at numbers that are sub $750 a month using MPI money and leveraging public land, which both these districts have close to about 2,000 lots in. Um, when we're, we're open to that proposal, but I just wanted the original question from the councilman was what BIA had produced in terms of affordable housing. And I thought it was really important um, to make sure that that was in context um, to what people can afford and where they're at. If I may just add one thing, uh, Mr. Chairman, to, to your question. Okay. It, it's this is this is not only not only is the BIA sincere about that that affordable home issues. We have a plan to build twelve thousand units, and I have reached to every council district council member personally to sit and put proposals out there. And this is not this is not literature. This is not us coming in with with some grandiose plan. This is actually proven by applications currently sitting with capital stacks of tens of millions of dollars in the land bank to produce affordable housing in every district. So the question becomes for us is, is what is the opportunity cost of losing projects that would otherwise work without inclusionary zoning? What is the opportunity cost? I will give you just one simple example and then I'll give it back to you. Is a 162 unit job on Lehigh Avenue where all housing was sub 100% AMI, anywhere ranging between 60% to 100% AMI. $50 million job, $220 million in economic impact, $1.5 million in transfer tax, with the 10-year tax abatement generating $100,000 in real estate taxes, created 400 jobs. That is a project that for it to work with the for 20% or 40% AMI, the land cost would have to be for that five acres, negative 2.5 million. Someone would have to hand us money to purchase that land for us to be able to have that bill work its way through that. And that is with numbers that construction cost two years ago. In today's world, 
it's a completely different story and the expiring tax agreement. Back to you, Ken. Thank you very much, uh, Councilman Allen Dow. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, I want to thank the bill co-sponsors for this legislation. I just had a quick question. You know, I'm trying to listen to both sides and understand. I think everyone's goal is the same. And I think the question is, how do we get to the goal? And so I have asked for today a fiscal impact statement on this legislation to uh, try to understand what the impact is so we can make an intelligent decision uh, when I guess it comes to council. But if anyone has any other thoughts or they've done an impact statement, because I'm hearing one side say one thing, another side say another, I would love for them to share it with us today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you. I'm going to call on um, Councilman Maria, Maria Keown and Sanchez. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. I, I just want to, again, be very, very clear, and I think I said this from the beginning. This is not a perfect tool, as none of our toolboxes are perfect tools. And I appreciate the BIA's work, and we have taken, as, as Councilmember Gautier says, we intend to work with them around some of the projects related to, to the land bank. In fact, I will be doing a groundbreaking in a couple of weeks of 100 affordable units in an entire neighborhood in a public-private partnership unlike anything we've seen in the city of Philadelphia. As I've repeated from the beginning, um, this legislation is, is meant to help us do with several things that with at which everyone has talked about. We have an inflated market in some of these neighborhoods and it will help us control some of the inflation as it relates to land. And the fact that speculation and speculators are flipping these properties, making the affordability uh, challenges. Uh, to Councilwoman Gartier's uh, point around the AMI, we are operating in neighborhoods where 30, 30 to 40% AMI is the reality of the neighborhood. We recognize that if the private sector can help us build affordable units, we will have to do what Ryan has talked about, right? How does PHA come in? How does Pathways to Housing? How do the shallow rent to get to a fixed income housing, how do we do that? So we are, what we're trying to do here is, and again, and I'll push back on this notion that this is an isolated uh, situation. We've done several different toolboxes that we're all sharpening to come to a more comprehensive view around how neighborhoods get developed. We understand the increase of uh, value of construction costs. There's a lot of unintended consequences as it relates to the prevailing wage and the high cost of construction, right? But all of the members on this group use it as like the quiet elephant in the room, won't talk about it, and won't lobby for an affordable housing rate that we need in order to make some of these uh, projects pencil more. So again, I appreciate the work. We will work on the implementation. I appreciate Council Member Dom asking for a fiscal statement. This is a pilot program. And so we are committed to working with all of the stakeholders in measuring, reviewing, and evaluating this. But when you have uh, the inability to pass a citywide mandatory inclusionary uh, piece, it's harder to measure, right? So no one's going to get to a measurement tool tomorrow or next week. We're going to have to put this in place with the other toolboxes, measure it, evaluate it. And as everybody on this call knows, particularly you know Mo and others who've worked in Kensington, we have made projects work, right? In the most Im impossible circumstances because we're committed to this, but we need more tools and we need sharp, and these tools are not perfect, but they, they are gonna push the conversation along as we work for, again, that diverse mixed income housing. The reason we have the voluntary 10% um, affordability in Kensington is because developers know if they're coming into this neighborhood, they know what is a priority because of the policy that I've set and the tone that I've set around inclusionary, uh, inclusionary housing. And even with that, you get folks who come in who are bad actors around trying to make sure that we're respecting some of the characters of some of these neighborhoods um, that we're operating. And so Again, this is not the end of the conversation. This is not the beginning of the conversation. This is the middle of a conversation. And I look forward, again, to the, its implementation, its review, and if necessary, its changes as we move this conversation along. But we're doing all different types of pilots to get to the point. And we understand that whether it's MPI, whether it's PHA, whether it's shallow rent, all of these toolboxes could be, could be utilized with the support of the private de uh, development to get to those lower AMIs to meet those critical needs and the harder needs of those harder to reach communities. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. 
Um, Jamal, just be patient with me. I'm going to have a call on just two council members who have questions, and then we'll wrap up this panel. Um, Councilman David O, then Councilwoman Cindy Bass. Yeah, thank you very much, Chairman. I'm just responding to some of the conversation um, about uh, a better understanding the bill and the information, the data. I've received nothing. I've received no information about this. And apparently, I guess, conversations and information has been shared with uh, council members, but certainly not with me. And it sounds like not with the rest of the at-large council members. Um, I do appreciate uh, a call from council member um, Kenyona Sanchez, who has given me her perspectives. That's the only perspective I have received. I do try to understand the bills, um, but uh, if uh, no one is providing me data or information, uh, I rely on my staff, and that, that's about what I have. So just for the public to understand, uh, these are complicated issues, and whoever has this information has not shared it with me, and I will be voting today. So it's a little late for me to, to, to start trying to understand what you're saying. Thank you. Councilman Cindy Bass. Um, good, good uh, morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, you know, I've been listening to all the testimony and I just really wanted to add in my perspective. Um, and I agree with uh, Councilman Maria Quinona, Quinona Sanchez that this this offering is, you know, it's not the end all. It's not, um, you know, going to immediately fix everything, but it is a start. It's imperfect, as she stated. But, um, you know, we're at a point where action is required. So I really just want to applaud my colleagues for bringing this piece of legislation forward, knowing that it's a step in the right direction. Uh, but I, I also wanted to encourage the development community, um, you know, the groups and also uh, individual individual developers at a later date to give us something we can live with. Um, I keep hearing that, um, you know, now it's not the time and that, you know, we should talk about it. We should think about it. I think from council side, we've been talking and thinking and, you know, uh, hoping and wishing for a very long time now. And so we really need um, you guys at the table to help develop the programs and the the um, uh, housing that we need um, for our constituents. So um, I just wanted to say this isn't a new problem. We've been discussing it, you know, for all of the years I've been on council. Um, you know, it's not a new situation. So I just really wanted to encourage the uh, development and community to really get in the game on this and to, uh, you know, uh, put up, let's see what, what, what you're working with. Let's see what ideas you have. But the idea that we should continue, continue to continue to delay um, while we wait for a solution, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's not um, uh, realistic for us. So, um, you know, I just wanted to uh, add my uh, thoughts in there, Mr. Chairman. And again, many thanks to my colleagues uh, for this pilot program. Again, this is a pilot. So I think the idea that we, um, you know, try something new, try something different is important. But what we cannot do is continue to think that we can do the same things and that we'll get a different result somehow. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. I'm going to call on at this time um, Jamal Johnson and next Nicole Westerman. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Jamal Johnson. I am the general manager of the Comcast Technology Center. However, I'm here today in my capacity as chair of the Building Owners and Managers Association of Philadelphia, commonly referred to as BOMA. I would like to thank Chairman Johnson and the Committee on Rules for this opportunity to testify on Bill Number 210633. As corporate members of this community, BOMA and its member buildings firmly support affordable housing both conceptually and practically. Philadelphia's economic and social vitality <clears throat> depends upon an adequate stock of affordable housing throughout the city. While recognizing the ongoing need for affordable housing, especially in these financially unstable times, we do not support the provisions of bill number 210633. Philadelphia is a city with a high poverty rate and correspondingly low rent revenues compared to other cities, add high construction costs and expiring tax abatement and inflation to the mix. And it becomes all too apparent that the concept of inclusionary zoning 
as proposed by this bill is completely unrealistic to implement. The zoning proposals contained in this bill could very well devalue the developments addressed herein, which would in turn negatively impact the value of affordable housing that council is seeking to protect. The business community, <clears throat> excuse me, the business community relies on predictable predictability and this aspect of the legislation will negatively impact law owners ability to control their land use within existing parameters. We encourage council to take a more holistic approach in this regard. Neither business development nor affordable housing operate in a vacuum. Rather, they must operate in tandem in order to be effective. We support, for example, the creation of wealth for disadvantaged communities by establishing affordable housing on public land, of which the city has an abundance. At the same time, this could very well provide a myriad of opportunities to support business development and job creation throughout the city, which could support further wealth creation for all. Affordable housing is an integral community component of the city's economy. Without it, the workers upon whom our businesses depend will leave the city in search of areas where they can find safe, comfortable, and reasonably priced homes for their families. Our residents, all of our residents, deserve affordable housing. Sadly, Bill number 210633, as written, would preclude most housing projects from receiving the required financing. This, in turn, would lead to a loss of the very jobs upon which Philadelphia economy depends. Thank you, Council, and thank you, Chairman Johnson, for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Nicole Westerman, please state your name and title for the record and begin your testimony. Hi, uh, good morning, Nicole Westerman, New Kensington CDC, Director of Real Estate and Economic Development. Thank you, Chairperson Johnson and members of the Rules Committee for holding this hearing. And thank you to Council Members Gautier and Quinonio Sanchez for their leadership on this bill. I'm here today to, to, to testify on behalf of New Kensington CDC in support of Bill Number 210633. Requiring a portion of, develop, of developments to be affordable is an important and necessary step in providing housing that average Philadelphians can afford. Philadelphia has the distinction of being the nation's poorest large city year after year after year, where our neighborhoods remain segregated year after year, where zip codes do determine life outcomes to a large extent. No matter how many times city officials create poverty action plans or shared prosperity plans or anti-poverty action committees. So this legislation is long overdue. If passed, this legislation will slow the rate at which Philadelphians are being priced out of their neighborhoods. While we support this bill, we also need to be very clear that it is only one of many steps that must be taken to make inroads in the city's affordable housing crisis and change development practices that run over lower income residents. The actual area median income in our primary service area is 31% of AMI. That's $20,600 for a single person household. Here's how things go in our neighborhood. The land bank sells city land to developers at deep discounts in exchange for commitments to build a portion of units at 60 to 80 percent AMI. The Zoning Board of Adjustment consistently ignores the recommendations of registered community organizations. The city increases its tax revenues. Developers pay their investors and pat themselves on the back for building affordable housing. That affordable housing is not even close to being affordable for people who live here or used to live here. It's affordable for people from other neighborhoods. They move in and more of our residents move out looking for housing that is truly affordable. So again, this bill should be only the first of many steps we take in Philadelphia to address our affordable housing crisis, one of which is the annual appropriation to the housing trust fund. Here in Kensington, we don't need 20% of units to be affordable. We need 100% of units to be affordable to make up for the hundreds of market rate units and 60 to 80 percent AMI units that have been built in recent years. We don't need this legislation to apply only to developments with 10 or more units. We need it to apply to smaller developments as well. We don't need this legislation to apply only to the few areas defined in this bill, but to all of Philadelphia. And I would also address some of the concerns of the other speakers about uneven practices across the city. 
Thank you again for considering this important bill. Please vote this bill out of committee. Please make sure it becomes law and please continue to work towards laws that benefit the Philadelphians who are burdened with high rents and mortgages, who are looking for affordable places for their families to live, who are in danger of losing their homes, who are being pushed out of their neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Always good to see you, Nicole. Um, your new role, taking care of business as usual. Good to see you. Any Thanks. questions and comments from members of the committee? Okay, just in wrapping up, uh, Mo Rushdie or Karen, I know you all are having the back and forth in the chat. Do you want to, any last minute comments before we call the next panel? Uh, 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 Councilman, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, my only comment was to uh, to uh, Councilwoman uh, Inara Sanchez when she when she spoke about just the land prices and that we we ran the numbers at zero land cost in in today's construction cost and the numbers don't work and the only reason is that the study the study relied by the 2018 study relied by, by that was done by PACDC with with, I think, uh, a director of equitable development in Councilwoman uh, 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 Jamie's office has based it on construction costs that are $60 per square foot less than what it is and ran it based on operating expenses on 5% for operating apartment buildings while banks underwrite it at 19%. So I'm just saying, I just wanted to put it on record out there that that circulating study um, is, is a study that has many faults and we would encourage a third party that would look at this legislation and really evaluate with with no bias on how this can work for the city. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. For the You're welcome. Karen? Yes, Mr. Chairman. I would just like um, folks to consider the entire community when deciding um, to do, to make adjustments in housing. As I said in my my um, chat, it's, I think it is racially insensitive for uh, developers who don't know the community to assume that what all that we're looking for is low income housing um, for folks who may be eligible for, for vouchers. We also need to look at in terms of maintaining the community, people who live in that community, but whose incomes do not make them eligible for vouchers. We are, are no less valuable and those who do, and to assume that you make housing available for the lowest income people on the um, on the income rung is, as I said, racially insensitive. Just to consider those things. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Karen. Any other questions or comments from members of the committee? Ryan? I just wanted to let Karen know and this committee know um, how SPAC Group operated 5050 Baltimore Avenue so that you are aware of the community had the same desire that you did. Uh, they wanted to ensure that the um, that the units that were available, um, that they went to community members. When we filed uh, on our Wade Flats project, which is currently under construction at 53rd and Whitby, uh, we had the same goal in mind. To ensure that that happened, we worked with the Planning Commission, we worked with the community that all of the um, of more affordable units uh, were made available through local congregations within a mile of the project before they went to the general public. The goal was that one, we didn't violate any housing laws, but simultaneously made sure that the units were made available to those in the community through the, the organizations. When we, after four weeks of marketing these units at Baltimore Avenue, did not receive a single application from the 15 congregations we reached out to, we then sent it to the registered community organizations within a half a mile. After we did that and not received any applications, we sent it to our council member's office, to our state rep's office. The whole purpose of us doing this without publicly putting it out there or going to our partners at PHMC or Valley Youth House was simply to ensure that it went to the community. When Wade Flats opens in 12 months, we will do the exact same thing to ensure that the more affordable units stay within the community. Displacement is a real thing. Our model 
tries to ensure that that doesn't happen. So we aren't aiming for the bottom. And in most scenarios, as the IZ bill, the current IZ bill legislates, you can't rent the unit for any more than you had deed restricted the apartment for. So in the current IZ bill, a two bedroom apartment is $1,026. If you look at what PHA vouchers would pay for a two bedroom apartment in a newly constructed building, it is more than what the IZ bill will even allow. Therefore, we cannot accept the top of the market for a voucher, even though by law, I can't turn anybody away from a voucher. When we asked the planning commission what to do about this, no one had an answer yet. So we're gonna cross that bridge when that building opens. But I can tell you that we do not build our units, the 91 units that we have built, they are not built for vouchers. But sometimes folks with vouchers come and rent those units. And by law, we are not allowed to turn them away and we will never do so as a company. So I just wanna let you know that that has never been our aim. We have worked tirelessly to ensure it stays within the neighborhood. The downside to this is that today's market conditions coupled with this legislation doesn't get us what we need. And it destroys projects that SPAC group would have put to market. And that is very, very, very sad. Okay. I would love the opportunity to sit down and, and talk with you. At it, some would be, it would be my honor. Okay. I'll be in touch. Thank you. Looking forward to it. And thank you to the committee for allowing me. Thank you very much. Uh, Mo, I just want to ask one other question. I know you talked about doing 100 units in the Kensington area. Is, the, is there a similar strategy where you and your team try to target local residents first before you open it up to the wider um, public? We have a very specific marketing plan that was developed with Council President Clark's office with its first four forward housing development that was done in 2015 that we built. And that marketing plan um, is, is, is very detailed where we um, approached, we approached close to about 30 different RCOs, churches, congregations, unions. We went out there and we were able to sell, and these were all for sale homes, um, sell 100% of the units from these meetings without going to market. We gave a chance for 90 days before going to market and we were successful in selling these from people in the community. And that is the same marketing plan that we're using in every application that goes out there to the land bank for affordable housing. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions or comments from members of the committee? Okay, hearing none, thank you everyone for your testimony. Would a clerk please call the next panel? Councilman Johnson, I had a question. I'm sorry, Councilman Allen Down. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have a couple quick questions. Can one of the developers uh, respond to what is the typical construction cost price per square foot? I just want to make sure I understand the numbers. We are currently at $160 a square foot for a three-story, $170 a square foot for a four-story, $185 a square foot for a podium plus four, Councilman. And just as an example, I want to understand, two years ago, would you have those numbers from two years ago? We were about twenty dollars a square foot less than what what they are today. Okay, and then I, don't, I was listening. I, I was curious as to what thirty five percent of AMI and a council member of ODA's district. What would the rent be for um, that type of a property? Thirty five percent. Well, a forty percent AMI one bedroom goes for, according to the PA uh, uh, Housing Authority. One bedroom for $725, a two bedroom for a 40% AMI is $870, and a three bedroom goes for $1,005, and that's for a 40% AMI. Okay. And that's all based on today's interest rates, correct? That is correct. Today, nope. we are able to finance jobs, councilmen, especially in areas like Kensington. There are major Philadelphia banks that are using... Uh, 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 CRE, CRE money, CRA money to finance these jobs are very low interest rates. But in the current climate, we're expecting anywhere between a one to two points over the next coming two to three years in high interest rate due to inflation. 
Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilman Dom, just to just to add to Mo's comment, um, in Cedar Park, um, which is one of the neighborhoods in the third district, um, our most expensive apartment in our entire portfolio in Cedar Park um, is a sixteen hundred and fifty dollar uh, two bedroom. Our rents at the highest of our market is around two dollars a square foot that reduced rate at the 35 to 40 percent ami mark puts it at a dollar 18 dollar 15 to a dollar 18 a square foot and so the, what this bill is asking is for every ninth and tenth of product to have a 75 cent per square foot or 85 cent per square foot reduction with the the incentives don't don't make up for that loss Okay, I understand. Have you actually met with lenders to see if it's feasible that we could, if this legislation did pass, that financing would be available under this scenario? I can tell you what happened when we built Wade Flats, which broke ground uh, eight months ago. Uh, when we got financing on that project, we have four deed restricted units in that project, um, all at 50% AMI deed restricted for the next 50 years. Our building had a $9.2 million appraisal. The bank underwrote the loan at 8.8 .8 million. So uh, we had a we had, we got we took a hit on what we could finance because of because of of the reduction in in uh, in rents. And the reality of the situation for us is that we had other units that we were voluntarily that were not deed restricted. Um, placing at lower AMIs. We have two units in that building that are at 60% AMI. Part of that was part of our conversations with the local community. The reality is they all got underwritten at, at lower rents because the bank wasn't going to underwrite it at top value, um, which meant our borrowing power was less. Um, and uh, two years ago when we started this process and 18 months ago when we started looking at financing at today at, at the construction costs that we were looking at it looked really really good over the last six months we've had our rear ends handed to us um, and we've had to modify a great deal of things in trying to keep the market rents as low as possible without blowing up the market um, it's been um it's been a crazy crazy dance of whack-a-mole well, i guess my and question I, and, and councilman if i may add to this just one thing is that the the going down from Ryan's sixteen hundred and fifty market rate rent, which is already at eighty percent AMI, going down to the forty percent AMI two bedroom at eight hundred and seventy dollars is basically a subsidy of eight hundred dollars per unit on per year. That's ten thousand dollars. If you have a hundred unit job sitting on an acre land, you're talking about twenty units being subsidized by two hundred thousand dollars a year, which have a value. A market value of three million dollars. When you're talking about one acre of land in Kensington going for 1.25 and 1.5 and the two million dollars per acre, your three million dollar subsidy has nothing to do with land prices. You need to be at a negative land value to make the deal work. In the neighborhoods where I am putting Kensington courts that you have honored us by doing the groundbreaking two years ago up on Lehigh or going to Somerset Avenue where we're going in areas that has not seen development, where we are underwriting these deals at fifteen fifty and sixteen hundred dollars for a two bedroom and building podium plus on hundred and eighty five dollars and no uh, and no offense against my friends and, and allies at GBCA where it's thirty percent only union or forty percent union. It doesn't it doesn't work. If it's a hundred percent union we would put this another 50 to 60 bucks a square foot. What I'm trying to say is the pressures on these deals with the expiring tax abatement, the high construction cost, even at low land prices, even at low land prices, and the, the, the very increasingly demanding bank requirements of basically 30% equity requirements, high, very low LT, uh, loan to cost, is putting the pressure that we can't make a 6% cash on cash or a 7% cash on cash on deals work. And the reality is, while we all want affordable housing, is at the end of the day, these units cannot be built without the financing. And hence, 
are pushing for public land disposition to solve that issue along with our support to MPI because together we think we can put 10,000 to 12,000 homes in five years easily. Well, I guess my question is that financing is such a big part of the equation here. Should we have the banks at the table to see what they can do? Maybe they can do something that's uh, preferred that would benefit and accomplish the goals of my colleagues here so we can make this thing work. Maybe that's an option. I don't know. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for your testimony today. Thank you. Just, I just wanted for the record, to, to, again, we, we are willing and we will review and evaluate and we're willing to look at um, some sort of assessment to look at this. But I just want to set for the record that most of the properties that we've identified are opportunity zone a land property where people can use OZ money, federal designated money, um, that they can defer to 2050. So there's, you know, I don't want to get into the nuances around the capital stack. I'm just saying that there is a way for these projects to work. We will continue that conversation. But when you don't add the fact that folks could have access to opportunity, to, uh, opportunity zone fund money, in particular in these designations where residents of Kensington did not have a say, those designations happening, I believe some of this stuff will be doable. And I'm willing, again, to continue to work with the BIA as we um, hopefully pass this and implement it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council Maria Keona Sanchez. Um, thank everybody for their testimony. Will the clerk please call the next panel? Pam Andrews, Deborah McCarty, Kelly Buchanan, Jackie Williams, Purple Blackwell, and Nadine Livingston. Thank you very much. Will the clerk please call the first panelist. How you doing, Deborah? Always good to see you. Welcome back. <laughs> good to see you as well. You can go ahead and start your testimony. Okay. Um, good morning, Council Member Johnson, uh, Council Members of the Rules Committee, and uh, Council Member Gautier. My name is Devin McCarty, and I am co chair of the Pountain Village Civic Association Zoning Committee. I'm here today to testify in support of Bill Number 210633. Some of the features which made me want to purchase a home in Pountain Village back in 1985 were the attractive, low-rise, porch-fronted Victorian homes, the diversity of the neighborhood, tree-lined streets, and its affordability. Much has changed since then. Today, I do not believe that I could afford to purchase a comparable home in Pountain. This is especially true for many neighbors less fortunate than I. Our civic association has worked and is working to preserve the attributes which made me want to live here. Those efforts include obtaining a neighborhood conservation overlay, pressuring developers to include affordable units in their product projects when they need a zoning variance, which is our sole leverage, seeking an, an historic district designation to name just a few initiatives. Unfortunately, these efforts have not yielded the results one would hope. It is our belief that Bill Number 210633 will address one of the most challenging issues we have faced by getting more affordable housing stock in the neighborhood. It will ensure that affordable choices are available for people of all incomes. With the amendments, the bill addresses concerns regarding respecting the current NCO requirements, and it will honor any new stipulations that accompany an historic district dis designation. For those reasons, Pountain Village supports bill number 210633. And before I conclude, I would like to point out that this legislation is only as good as its enforcement. We continue to face challenges in getting various city departments to adequately enforce city code. This is incredibly frustrating. We therefore would encourage council and the administration to devote the required resources to ensure compliance once the legislation is enacted. This concludes my testimony on behalf of the Pountain Village Civic Association, and we respectfully request that Bill Number 210633 be voted out of committee. Thank you for this opportunity to testify on this legislation. 
Thank you very much for your testimony. Next, I'm going to ask Massage Purple Blackwell to please state your name for the record and get your testimony. Um, greetings. My name is Sajda Purple Blackwell, and I am here representing Blackwell Culture Alliance, West Philadelphia organization. And I have a um, pleased to be here with you all today to testify. Please begin your testimony. Okay. I am a newly uh, a new homeowner in in West Philadelphia, um, off of Fifty Second Street in Sampson. And um, in purchasing, in this experience in purchasing a house in West Philadelphia, it was absolutely horrible. Um, we were victims of predatory um, land ownership and predatory developers um, who then uh, originally who tried to sell our house for three times the worth. So we feel like being priced out of affordable housing is an understatement in West Philadelphia, as our property was originally um, Originally, uh, 77000 was the cost, but they ended up trying to sell it to us for $286,000 in West Philadelphia. Who can afford those prices? So we are the voice of the people, and we see this going on every day. The prices are jumping and tripling um, just for sales um, in our neighborhood. So right now, we know that the housing is not affordable, and we would like to definitely support this bill. Um, bill number 21633, presented by council. We want to thank um, Councilwoman Garcia for including us in this um, hearing. And just to let people know that the reality is something different than what's being spoken about. Thank you very much, Purple, for your testimony. Always good to see you as well. Keep up the good work. Will the clerk please call the next witness? Mr. Chair, the next witness is Kelly Buchanan. Kelly, just state your name and title for the record and begin your testimony. Good morning, members of the Committee on Rules and Guests. My name is Kelly Buchanan, and I live in West Philadelphia in the Haddington, Cobbs Creek, and Carroll Park communities. I am the RCO Chair for Achievability's RCO, and I'm here today, today to testify in support of Bill 210633. The bill creates a mixed income neighborhood zoning overlay in sections of the third and seventh council districts. If this bill is passed, it will be the first and only part of the Philadelphia zoning code that requires affordable housing from new development projects. The passing of this bill is important to me personally, as well as to my community counterparts for many reasons. Many of them we have heard discussed this morning, but I will highlight three of them here. This bill is important because it ensures people don't get priced out of the neighborhoods they grew up in where they're seeing a lot of new constructions and changes in demographics. People of all incomes deserve the right to have access to safe and affordable housing, where there are jobs, transit, parks, and also access to healthcare right where we live in our communities. This bill is also important because it gives an opportunity for former members who have already been displaced to come back. At this time, we know there is much construction and newly rehab homes costing more than most people who live in these communities can reasonably afford. Just as Purple Blackwell mentioned, the reality is different than the numbers that we're seeing on the paper. I'm sure there is some way we can come to terms with figuring out how developers can build properties without costing an exuberant amount of money. A one bedroom apartment on Germantown Avenue is going for $1,100 per month. And a newly rehabbed three bedroom house on South 50th Street is going for $1,700 per month. I have family members and friends who are renting, and the rent increase has caused major financial distress and even displacement. 
Since over 2018, 3,000 housing units in these types of buildings, newly rehab projects, have been approved in the third district, and none of them were designated as affordable. If this bill had been in place in 2018, the city would have secured 600 new homes with restricted rents for 50 years. That means a lot to families and people in our neighborhoods that are getting gentrified, they're looking better, but the people who live there cannot afford to pay these rents. In closing, this bill does more than stop people from getting displaced. It also provides an opportunity for people to come back to Philadelphia. Council member Gaudier and Sanchez have decided that we just cannot do nothing about this housing crisis. We have to try something different. It's time to stop watching and waiting and hoping. We have to take action. Having no affordability requirement in the zoning code would just lead to more of what we have now, which does not help the people of my community. For these reasons and testimony, I hope that this committee will give a supportive vote to this bill. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Buchanan. Would a clerk call the next witness? Mr. Chair, the next witness is Jackie Williams. Yes, good afternoon. My name is Jackie Jacqueline Williams. I'm with Lancaster Avenue Business Association, uh, 21st Century Business Association, CDC, and we are also an RCO. Uh, again, good afternoon to all council members, and um, I'm so happy to be able to uh, speak in support of this bill, 210663 uh, overlay bill. As a business association, a CDC and a RCO, we have in the last 10 years seen an increased development on Lancaster Avenue, particularly between 34th to 40th streets. While development brings economic development to the avenue, the development has not been inclusive. And we all know that progress comes with some pain. It's unfortunately that the pain that uh, this, some of this project progress has caused is uh, for the current residents in the area. This bill is an attempt to address some of the social injustice that happens when development is rampant and it is not accountable as it could be. And we do understand that developing housing is expensive. However, it should not be at the expense of the people who have helped this city to grow and to become the best city that it can be. We do have our challenges and we will continue to have our challenges. But we know that Philadelphia historically has been a place of inclusiveness. Uh, to include di includes diverse populations. So it is important to include, to, com uh, to continue that history of inclusiveness and not to become exclusive because of the continuing development. So I, we would, as a, a business association, would like to see this bill, 2120, O six three three voted out of committee and into law. Thank you so much for having my testimony. Would a clerk please call the next witness? Mr. Chair, the last witness is Nadine Livingston.
Mr. Chair, it appears that Ms. Livingston was disconnected. That was the okay, last any witness. Other any other questions or comments from members of this committee? Um, oh, Council, Councilman Jamie Gardier. You're on mute. Did we miss Pam, Pam Andrews or is she not on today? A council member, I was informed that Ms. Andrews had technical difficulties and we're making an it's attempt to add her. Now. She said it was back online. She called me. I don't see her again. So I guess she still have it. I don't see her as connected. Uh, yeah. Council member, uh, we're making an attempt to add her to public comment so she can testify by phone. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to take an opportunity to thank everybody from my community that testified today in support of the bill um, and in support of um, equity and justice in our neighborhoods. And thank you all for also the work that you do um, and the service that you provide to our neighborhoods every single day. Thank you, everyone. Um, is there anyone else here to testify on the bill whose name has not been called? Hearing none at this time, the committee will take a brief pause to allow members of the public who have registered for public comment to be called into this virtual meeting. We will now hear the testimony of those who have signed up for public comment. The clerk will call your name and once called, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Will the clerk please call the first witness for public comment? Uh, council member, uh, Mr. Chair, if I could just confirm with council support that they've connected the witnesses for public comment. Sure. Yes, we are still working. We're going to need a few more minutes to get the public uh, comment participants online.
Mr. Chair, we are now live. Thank you very much. And those who have been signed up for public comment, the clerk will call your name. And once called, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Eli Spector. Eli, Eli Spector. Okay, if he's not available, Joe Shu, please call the next individual. Abdul Ibrahim Muhammad. Hello, can you Eli hear me? Spector, now on. Uh, this is Eli Spector. Um, I am a resident of uh, 51st Street in King Sessing in Philadelphia. Uh, my comment is, is that I believe that this is a really great piece of legislation. We've had a voluntary um, affordability provision that's had really low uh, low participation for the last few years. Um, and I think affordability is one of the, the key challenges for the city's continued growth and vibrance, both economically and uh, in terms of diversity. And I think that um, there's still plenty of demand, um, even after 20 percent, uh, you know, affordability. Obviously, you know, you're still recouping some of your investment as a developer um, off of those, even the affordable units. Um, and there's so much, so much demand for housing in these areas. I believe it's uh, of most importance for us to, you know, incentivize affordability. Um, and, you know, if, if the developers who uh, are used to not having to have affordability and getting really record profits um, are unhappy about that, I think that's a, a cost the city can bear. And if they're not going to develop, that's also a cost the city can bear because there's, you know, other people who will come in and develop um, at those at those profit margins. So that's my comment. Um, and I hope that uh, the reception was fine and everything. Um, so I really hope the city council uh, sees fit to approve this legislation moving forward. Thank you very much. I have no idea so if that was a beep or not. Thank you I very much. I started talking. It's okay, but we heard you loud and clear. Thank you very much. Would a clerk please call the next witness? Abdul Rahim Muhammad. If witnesses are uh, muted, they can press star six to unmute themselves. So, shoot, let's keep moving forward. Can you call on the next witness? Yvonne Haskins. Yvonne, Yvonne Haskins. Modesto, is there is, is, there, is something wrong with the system or people just aren't signing on? Yeah, our our system is fine. It may be that they're okay. actually doing hello. Okay, I session. So I there's a delay. And I hope that I'm yes. Who am I speaking to? Speak at this point. My name is Yvonne Haskins. I'm a real estate attorney. I've been an owner of affordable housing in Germantown for over thirty years. I'm calling today out of deep respect for the two council members who have proposed this legislation and, and, uh, and even uh, deeper respect for the community people who testify in favor of it. I do think that there are serious flaws in the approach that's being taken here. And I, I, I don't think that, um, that we are being as, as, um, as smart as we can be in trying to address affordable housing in Philadelphia. My biggest question whenever, as a real estate attorney, whenever I see another overlay is that I'm worried very, I'm worried that the zoning code, and I didn't hear anybody testify to this today, and that's why I'm focused <clears throat> on this. I'm worried that we will 
soon sync the zoning code as a comprehensive planning document. It is very difficult to look at various overlays on each of the 10 districts and understand what is required even today. And now we're going to put another overlay on two districts with the others not being impacted. And, and I just wonder how, ma how many times are we going to approach improving the zoning code by tinkering, by, by ch changing a district um, overlay here and there. The second concern I have is with affordable housing as pre prescribed here, I don't see how it can be enforced. It is, I have, have had the experience of getting low income housing tax credits for small development that we did 20 years ago. And I know that even the state with all of its apparatus um, has limited opportunity to monitor the low income housing tax credit projects in Philadelphia. I am very concerned that, I, that there is no way this will be enforced, can be enforced, and it's a 50 year um, uh, proposal. And so I'm asking that we, we sit back a minute and we consider what we need to do in Philadelphia. I think in Philadelphia, we need to bring housing experts, economic experts, as well as the developers to the table. I don't think banks will, will, will help at all. But I do think that understanding a way to predict, pre produce affordable housing and be honest about it is, is what we need here in Philadelphia. And I, I understand that probably my comments will not be heated. My comments will not um, uh, have any uh, significance for this proceeding because I, I know that council manning prerogative is strong and, and well in city council. But I thought that I should at least add my voice to the concern I have of, about the balkanizing of the zoning code and the lack of enforceability here. Finally, I will say that I don't understand what the area median income is level is that we're addressing. Are we talking about a region or are we talking about Philadelphia? Some of the rents that I've heard are pretty high and they certainly wouldn't address the poverty level um, incomes that we have in Philadelphia. Thank you for letting me speak and I don't know what I do except to um, I guess thank, hang up. Well, thank you. Yeah, you can just hang up, but thank you very much for your testimony. Will the clerk please call the next person to provide public comment? Danielle Jones. Good morning. My name is Danielle Jones. Um, I've been a resident in the West Philadelphia area, Mantua, for the last five years and have seen um, a tremendous amount of development that's happening um, in the neighborhood. Um, coming from uh, the New York area where the neighborhood I lived in was um, quickly developed, gentrified, the whole nine, seeing this here now in my new neighborhood um, was not necessarily unfamiliar. And I don't think that um, development has to necessarily be a bad thing, but I think that um, it does need to be um, a very thoughtful process as it's coming and respecting the people that have been in the neighborhood and have, um, you know, a allowed for this uh, development to sort of get to um, this point. Um, I do think that this bill is a good opportunity to um, address some of the um, uh, affordable housing issues. I think it's a good starting point. I don't think that it is um, all um, inclusive, um, but I think it, it, it's, it's an opportunity for us to, to try something and um, be able to have a point of measure and see something um, hopefully positive come out of it. Um, I will um, express a similar concern though um, about accountability 
Um, I think the lady that was just speaking brought up a, a good point. If we're going to do something like this, then we have to make sure that there are true measures in place to make sure that people are abiding um, by these rules so that they make sense and, um, you know, we can really truly see some results from that. So that's my piece. Thank you. Thank you very much. Will the clerk please call the next person for public comment? Sophia Poe. Sophia Poe. Clerk, please call the next person to provide testimony. Andrea James Johnson. Hi, this is Andrea Johnson. I am a community activist um, from Girl You Could Do It Inc. as well as a talk show host for Black and Blessed in the Morning. Um, I'm calling in support of Bill Amendment uh, to the to amendment to the bill 210633. Um, I want to say, you know, plainly stated, the lack of affordable housing in neighborhoods of color um, plays a significant role in our city's ongoing systematic racial inequalities. As an obstacle to economic advancement, the lack of affordable housing and the health and economic challenges that come with it falls disproportionately on people of color. There has to be accountability across the board with regards to how these developers are able to come into these neighborhoods and displace people from their homes and then build these properties that no one can afford to live in. Um, again, the numbers that were stated in the inflation in regards to inflation and abatements and all, why couldn't that have been given to residents here in our city so that the city, so that these residents can afford housing? Remember, the governor was just on um, earlier today talking about health care. Well, housing is health care. If you don't have housing in your city, um, you your foster care system increases, your homeless population increases, all these things increase. Now, when people are priced out of the or have no place to live, you have more incidents of you have residents in your own city that you see living outside their cars. You know, the rates of HIV and AIDS increase. The rates of COVID increase. So we have to do better as a city because we are. There is a serious, so, serious social injustice that's being done to persons that you know, to the average persons, the native Philadelphians. I want to say um, that can't afford, but works very hard in, to make sure that they help to maintain their city. Um, so I am really in favor of this amendment to this bill to add, you know, that. Um, that pricing and I mean the um, amendment to make these house, housing more affordable. Again, those numbers that was given out earlier, they need to really the city needs to really check on those numbers to make sure that's actually what's happening. Because if you listen to the community, these apartments are not going for as cheap as they're being told. A lot of them that were being told on this call on this um, session today. So thank you for listening. Um, and I really appreciate um, this bill being drafted up as even though it's only starting in the third and the seventh uh, district, hopefully this is something citywide that can happen so that way residents that's here from Philadelphia can continue to afford to live in their city. Thank you. Thank you very much. Will the clerk please call the next person for public comment? Marcos Lomelli. Uh, uh, buenas tardes. Uh, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, buenas tardes. Uh, my name is Marcos Lomelli. I'm the program director at SEBA, a coalition of Latino community-based organizations in Philadelphia. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to testify today on Bill 210633. This bill is important to Latinos, the poorest ethnic group in the nation's poorest big city. The establishment of a minimum amount of affordable housing developments in certain mixed income neighborhood overlay districts will help preserve the diversity and vibrancy of our Latino neighborhoods. Latinos face an affordable housing crisis. The median household income in the 19133 zip code, which is the heart of the Latino community and the center of one of the proposed overlay zones, is less than $15,000 a year. 
For a working family of four, that's just not enough to keep the lights on. Furthermore, less than 50% of households in that zip code own their own home. Seba is heartened to see that City Council once more takes steps to rise to the challenge of solving this affordable housing crisis. We express our support for the passage of Bill 210633, but respectfully request that you consider the following changes to the bill. Number one, adjusting the requirements for affordable rental units by either using the AMI of a smaller geographical unit than the HUD-defined metropolitan area, or by lowering the income limits to 20%. As it stands right now, the affordable rental units would have a monthly cost of about $945 for a family of four. Sad to say that there are many families in our community for whom this is just not affordable. By lowering the income limits to 20%, a family of four earning $18,900 would be able to make use of these units. This is more affordable. Number two, increasing the value of the payments in lieu from section three, subsection B, back up to $18 per square per multiplied by surface area or $28,800 per unit as was in the original bill. There will be, as you well know, massive developments coming to our neighborhoods in the next few years. And by doing this, council can help ensure that those who have built and preserved these neighborhoods can still live in them when the development does come. We are glad to see language introduced to section two, subsection B, uh, B, the definition of a residential housing project to encourage those seeking to do for-profit development in several different parts of our neighborhood on a smaller scale to also contribute to the affordable housing stock. It is only fair that we all do our part to preserve the diversity and vibrancy of our neighborhoods. We are also glad to see amendments made to the bill in section three, subsection C, that will protect other affordable housing developers, such as community-based organizations, from being further burdened by this bill. We want to once again thank Council for taking up the challenge of preserving affordable housing for our city. We look forward to continuing to work together to find solutions for the housing affordability crisis in our city. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much for your public comment. Would a clerk please call the next individual for public comment, please? Abdul Rahim Muhammad. Abdul Rahim Muhammad. Hello. Mr. Muhammad, is that you? Yes, I'm, I'm not clear if I got this thing set up right or not. Uh, you, you have it set up right. Just say, just say your name for the record and begin your public comment. I mean, the thing is, I'm not clear. When I'm talking, are you just recording me or something that didn't plan it, or is it live? Because I'm listening to this phone, and I'm hearing people talking, but it ain't the same people that's talking in this on this webinar I'm looking at. But this is live, sir, and if you start your testimony, I will hear you. Um, if you Mr. Turn Chair, down your he might have his screen. TV on. He might be also watching on his TV, which is confusing. Okay, turn your TV down, Mr. Muhammad. Say that again. Want to turn your music? Want to turn your TV down? I mean, I can hear you. I'm asking you. We we can hear when you. When I'm too, talking sir. to you on this phone. Is this voice communications going on this TV? Yes. You want to start your testimony, sir? Do you want me to start talking? Yes, sir. Yes, my name is Abdul Rahim Mohammed. And I'm the director of the ICPIC New Africa Center, CDC, located at 4243 Lancaster Avenue. Um, I'm really happy to have this opportunity as a resident of the Belmont community. My family has been in this community for over 125 years. And I support this bill, 210-633, because it's 
mandating that affordable housing be made available to the residents of this community. And there's a housing crisis in the community, and I applaud the council members for designing this bill. I understand that the uh, developers have issues about pricing, and I also understand that the community is in a crisis with a need for affordable housing. So there's a need for the developers and the city to partner in such a way that affordable housing can be made available to the community. The Ipic New Africa Center, CDC, actually have a, a community development project on the 4200 block of Lancaster Avenue where we're looking to develop affordable housing. We've also rebranded that community as the new Freedom District and design a historic tour about the early African-American community and its rich cultural history and legacy. And that legacy and history must be preserved. And with the gentrification going on in our community today, you may not know in another 25 years that African-American people even lived in that community. So I strongly support this bill, and I strongly support developing affordable housing for this community, and I compliment the council members for their vision and designing this new inclusive area uh, zoning bill. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Muhammad. Will the clerk please call the next person for public comment? Michael Cunningham. Good morning. Good morning, council members. My name is Michael Cunningham. I am testifying this morning on the mixed income neighborhoods overlay bill number 210633. I'm the current president of the Philadelphia chapter of the American Society of Appraisers. I commend Councilwoman Gaudier and Keona Sanchez for their attention to supporting affordable housing. My concern is that the proposed legislation does not take into account differences between Philadelphia and areas where mixed income legislation has been successful. Mixed income requirements have been successful in areas where annual median incomes are much higher than in the neighborhoods where they are proposed to be um, applied under this legislation. In addition, the proposed affordable requirements of 20% of units in residential buildings of 10 units or less do not support increasing the goal of increasing the number of affordable units because the legislation does not con consider the market as a whole. In particular, the low AMI rent required in affordable units under this legislation will make multifamily projects of fewer than 200 units economically unfeasible. Given that the majority of newer units in Philadelphia come from medium-sized, smaller multifamily buildings, this legislation is likely to reduce the number of multifamily units ultimately constructed. This will have a negative impact on residential supply, and as a result, will actually increase gentrification on, in the row house neighborhoods of Cobb Creek, Parkside, and Mantua. In addition, the extension of the boundaries and the requirement to Lancaster and Baltimore Avenue will negatively impact construction along our most transit-oriented streets where we need to add more density. 
In addition, the proposed boundaries in the 7th district are likely to promote direct gentrification of low house streets in the boundaries since larger developments will be unfeasible. What most concerns me about this proposal is that there is no evidence the City Council has performed the necessary analysis to understand how this proposed legislation will impact the economic feasibility of multifamily development in the 3rd District and the 7th District going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much for your public comment testimony. Would a clerk please call the last person for public comment? David Feldman. Good afternoon, Chairman Johnson, Council Members Sanchez, uh, Gautier, and members of the Council's Committee on Rules. My name is David Feldman, and I serve as the Executive Director of the Development Workshop um, here. Thank you for letting us testify on Bill Number 210633 and for the lively and informative discussion we've heard uh, today on this issue. The Development Workshop understands Council's intent to continue to grow affordable housing options in Philadelphia. The Workshop is proud to have stood with City Council on this issue and has advocated for many past initiatives, including the increase in the real estate transfer tax that's provided $100 million to the Housing Trust Fund and the Neighborhood Preservation Initiative. The Development Workshop uh, supports the testimony on the uh, broad testimony in the bill we heard today from NIAP, GPCA, BIA, BOMA, and Yvonne Haskins. And uh, we do, however, have some uh, specific concerns about the impact on this, of the bill and the ever-increasing control city government is having over private development projects. There's no question that the legislation will increase development costs, as we've heard this morning, within the geographic area set forth in this ordinance. Um, and I'll... I'll Go over some of that. Some of that was covered by the earlier testimony. Um, furthermore, creating uh, on-site units over making contributions to the Housing Trust Fund, Council is effectively outsourcing its affordable housing plan to the private market. Philadelphia needs family-sized units to accommodate affordable housing, not um, a preponderance of studio and smaller one-bedroom affordable units that the ordinance would likely yield given what the market rate demands are for new um, larger scale development. Secondly, the development workshop asks that if this, this ordinance does become law, that council take time to study its impact, as we've heard concerns today, before adding any additional neighbors to its catchment. We will not know if this legislation is successful for several years following its enactment. It'll take time to determine if the ordinance was successful in delivering affordable units to neighborhoods, or if it completely cooled off any development. And we appreciate that council member Quinona Sanchez, um, uh, her comments today, understanding um, this, uh, this concern. Um, also, there is a concern about the bureaucratic aspects of having a mix of government regulated income restricted units in the same project as a primarily privately owned and managed property. It's unclear what documentation will be required each year, which city agencies will have oversight, if that could change going forward, and what delays in government processes will add to costs and funding delays in operations of each year. It's also not clear if restrictions will change or terminate if this bill is subsequently changed. Um, so we are encouraging the committee to hold the bill at this time um, because there has been um, you know, had three hours of testimony and uh, a lot of information that was clear was not presented previously. Um, and we did not have the sort of um, meetings of those who actually build things over the summer that we thought would have. So we need to take time to really um, look at the information that was provided today, questions that council raised today, um, to get those responses before it moves forward because further amendments will probably be necessary. Given the deep level of poverty in this city, um, rent subsidies, are something that are going to need to be part of any project, especially looking at the affordability levels that many people have requested um, because of the poverty level in these neighborhoods of 40% of AMI. People talk about 30% and 20%. Um, we understand that and agree that. Those levels can only be reached if, is, if there is also subsidy put in. Um, there were a few people who testified that there are 700 jurisdictions where there is a 
in mandatory inclusionary zoning, and as at least one person testified, these are primarily in California, New Jersey, and Massachusetts. This is from the Lincoln Institute study of inclusionary zoning. And if you look at that, the Lincoln Institute says, if you're going to have mandatory inclusionary zoning, you really need to have some combination of four elements, which is free land, as the BIA laid out very clearly this morning, uh, and others, real estate tax exemptions in excess of other places. And we have actually have the real estate tax exemption starting the first of this coming year. Zoning bonuses, which is the one thing this does address, or public subsidies, which, again, several people have spoken about and are required if you're going to get down to the levels of AMI that are needed in these neighborhoods and that clearly community wants but doesn't financially work in projects um, the way this bill is laid out. There's a reason that landlords have been selling off properties in Philadelphia at a higher rate than any city in the United States, as studied by the University of Pennsylvania. Vince Reina was part of that study and by Pew. Um, and so I won't take any more time to go into that detail as well. Uh, I welcome any questions at this time. If there's any council members who have questions about, sorry, I also gave you detailed testimony, but it's an incredibly complex bill. So thank you for allowing me to present this testimony today. And again, if there are any questions, I will hold on and wait and see. Thank you very much, David. Um, is there anyone else here to testify on the bill whose name has not yet been called? Thank you very much. This concludes the hearing. We will now go into a public meeting. If you are on the line for public comment, you can now please disconnect while we go into official public hearing. I want to thank all the panel witnesses for their participation today. We value your input. I'll now invite again all panel and witnesses to please disconnect from the meeting before we go into our public meeting. From the hearing before we go into our public meeting, we will now pause the proceedings briefly as multiple participants leave the hearing. Excuse me, uh, Mr. Chair, we do have Pam um, online. Okay. Pam, you want to please state your name? For the record, and please go ahead with your public comment before we wrap up and go into a public meeting. Thank you so much. My name is Pam Andrews, and I am the chair of West Houghton Saunders Park RCO. And I thank you for the opportunity to speak um, on this matter, which is vital to my community. I'm in support of the council person's um, stand on protecting affordable housing. Nationwide, affordable housing is an issue. Here in my community, development is the reality. The economics of development have meant that families um, here have been for generations are being displaced from their local roots, churches, and schools. Development should not equal displacement. On the matter of funds to offset the effects of development, do not necessarily return to the area being affected. In West Powhatan, the development trend is to convert single-family homes into multifamily apartment units. Developers pay into the housing trust fund, and in exchange, they construct taller, denser buildings, which are unaffordable to even medium-income Philadelphians and are incongruent with the existing housing stock. And there are no assurances that money paid into the fund will be returned to the, to the community and will not be used to further displacement someone else in, somewhere else in the city. Therefore, I applaud Councilwoman Scottier's um, efforts to ensure a mixed income community is maintained in West Palton. Thank you so much for your time. No, thank you very much. This concludes the public hearing. Uh, the committee will now go into a public meeting to consider the action to be taken on the bills before this committee. I want to also make sure that there's no one else who's on the line for a public comment. If not, want to make sure that everyone disconnects before we go into our public meeting. We will now convene the public meeting. Will the clerk please call the roll? To take attendance, members that are in attendance will please indicate that they are present. When the names are called, also please say a few brief words when responding so that your image will be displayed on screen when you speak. 
um, Joe Shu, before you call the roll, is Councilman Curtis Jones. <laughs> Councilman Curtis Jones um, connected. Councilman, I believe that he remained logged in but departed the meeting to attend to other business. Joe, um, um, his chief of staff, Mr. Cohen, do you want to check with your councilman and see if you want to participate in this vote? No, I have but I think, I mean, I'm clear. I'm glad you brought this up because it's my. I'm sorry. So, can the clerk please call the uh, roll? Council Member Squilla. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and colleagues present. Council Member O. Good afternoon, Council Chair and colleagues. I'm present as well. Council Member Bass. Good afternoon to everyone. I am present. Council Member Gilmore Richardson. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and colleagues. I am present. Council Member Heenan. I don't believe Council Member Heenan is present. Council Member Quinona Sanchez. Good afternoon. I am present. Thank you for your patience. Council Member Jones requested that he be recorded as voting aye. Council Member O'Neill. Yes, I'm here. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. A little trouble with the computer. Thank you. Mr. Chair, quorum is present. Thank you. We will now go into our public meeting. Public meeting to amend bill number 210633. The chair recognizes Councilman Mark Squilla for a motion on the amendment to bill number 210633. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I offer an amendment to bill number 210633. A copy of the amendment has been circulated to all members of the committee. I move that the amendment to bill number 210633 be approved. Second. The chair notes for the record that council member Maria Keona Sanchez seconds the motion. It has been moved and properly seconded. That the amendment to bill number 210633 be approved. All those in favor of the motion will signify by <laughs> saying aye, aye. 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 Those opposed? The ayes have it. The motion carries and the amendment to bill number 210633 has been approved. The chair recognizes Councilman Mark Squilla for a motion on bill number 210633 as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move the bill number 210633 as amended be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended as to permit the first reading of this bill at the next session of council. Okay. Who seconded that? Can I get a second? Who else again? The chair notes for the record that Councilman Maria Keona Sanchez seconds the motion. It has the moving property second that bill number 210633 as amended be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended to permit first reading of this bill the next session of council. All those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and the motion carries. This concludes the meeting. If there are no additional remarks, uh, this concludes all business in front of the committee on rules today. I want to take a moment to thank all my colleagues for being patient through this four hour hearing and staying um, online so we can do a quorum, but I also want to acknowledge the hard work of my two colleagues, Councilman Maria Keona Sanchez and Councilwoman Jamie Gardier, to address the issue that's very critical. Um, and very, very important in a city which we all recognize is a tale of two cities, a tale where some folks are doing great and a tale where some people aren't doing so great. 
And hopefully this will get us, I'm pretty confident this will get us to the next level as we look at a comprehensive overall strategy to address the issue of affordable and workforce housing here in the city of Philadelphia. But I do want to acknowledge the two of you for your hard work um, and your dedication. This, this is not like legislation that just happened overnight. And so um, I just want to acknowledge the two of you for your due diligence. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and to the committee and to my partner in this, um, Councilmember Pinona Sanchez. Thank you, everyone, and have a good day.